Uh, well, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 23rd meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2023. Uh, the first item on our agenda is uh, for members of the committee to agree or not to take agenda items uh, four and five in private this morning. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Um, the first um, uh, item on our agenda is uh, consideration of the Scottish Government's response uh, to the report which this committee produced um, in the spring of this year uh, on new vessels for the Clyde and Hebrides arrangements to deliver vessels 801 uh, and 802. Uh, so can I welcome our witnesses this morning. Um, Fiona Hislop, the Minister for Transport, joins us. Uh, and along with the Minister is uh, Colin Cook, uh, Director for Economic Development uh, in the Scottish Government. Alison Irvin, who's the Interim Chief Executive at Transport Scotland. Uh, and also joining us is Chris Wilcock, who's the head of the Ferries Unit uh, at Transport Scotland. We've got a number of questions to ask, uh, Minister, but I think, first of all, we'd like to invite you to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Committee. And I thank the Committee for their invitation to address further the report prepared into arrangements to deliver new vessels 801 and 802 and the Scottish Government's response to it sent to the Committee in May 2023. The Committee will be aware that I was appointed as Transport Minister in June 2023. I am aware that the Committee felt that the Scottish Government did not respond as fully as it would have expected and I want to address that in my opening remarks. Uh, firstly, as confirmed in the then Minister's response, the Scottish Government fully welcomed the report from the committee. This built on the work already undertaken by Audit Scotland and the earlier report by the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. The report contained a number of observations and recommendations throughout. Now, whilst the response was not on a point-by-point -point basis to all of the stated views, the observations and conclusions of the committee, the government's response did extract the key recommendations for the, for the government that could be identified in the report and set out the Scottish Government's response to these. And the approach taken was to group these where we felt there was a common theme. Where there were recommendations for other parties, such as the Auditor General, the government did not comment in detail, but noted uh, um, we could engage fully with further audit work if identified. The response uh, came from the previous Transport Minister, so I'm keen to identify which specific areas the committee consider warrants a further response to that um, already given, either today or in writing, if that would be helpful. I have, have, I have however, recently read the report in great detail again, um, and I have, in my scrutiny of what has been requested to government, um, have identified two areas which were not fully responded to. Both, on, both uh, are on wider cross-government areas and process improvements, so I'm sure the committee re receives a response to those. Having spent two years until June as Deputy Convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and as a member of the Economy Committee, I take the work of all parliamentary committees very seriously and I'm committed to making sure the committee has what it, is, it needs to conclude its work on this important matter. Finally, I'd like to highlight that my colleague Neil Gray gave evidence to the Net Zero um, Energy and Transport Committee on the current issues. Um, I also did um, earlier this week as well, and this committee may also be aware that a further update from the CEO of the shipyard on delivery progress is due to be given to the Net, Z uh, Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee at the end of the month. Um, ministers will continue to work with the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee in its scrutiny of this element. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we, uh, of, of course, note the point about your appointment being after the report had been published and the response uh, received from the government. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that uh, our um, sense of it was that we produced uh, 13 overall conclusions uh, and six uh, were responded to, uh, one was partly responded to, and six weren't responded to at all. So I think the reason why we were keen to have this session was to try to uh, explore a bit more of those areas where we felt as though uh, there had been an insufficient response uh, given the weightiness of the conclusions uh, that we'd reached. Um, I, I suppose I want to begin uh, by going to a, a, a fairly fundamental point, uh, which is that um, we uh, reached the conclusion uh, that um, uh, both island communities, uh, taxpayers uh, and indeed the workforce um, had been uh, badly let down and um, we wondered whether you wanted to take the opportunity this morning to comment on that. Uh, and secondly, uh, do you consider 
uh, yourself at where responsibility lies for the uh, six-year delay, three times and counting over budget, uh, of the um, procurement of these two vessels? So these were obviously conclusions for the committee. It's, it's for the, the committee to come up with their own opinions, their own views, their conclusions. I think it's self-evident that uh, islands have been let down, and I understand that. And you know, I've spent the, uh, the summer as the new transport minister meeting a number of island communities and also their ferry communities. I think resilience in the fleet is really important. There are other issues in relation to ferries, which are, that's the, the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee have, have been dealing with, and more to do with operational management issues, which is not the core function of this committee. And resilience in the fleet is really important, which is why um, having the six ferries delivered before 2026 will make a big difference in terms of that resilience, uh, because it's the resilience, I think, that underpins that, and that's why those replacements um, are really essential. Um, clearly, we know that there are current delays, and we'll hear more, and that's why I referred to the Chief Executive's regular updates to the, the uh, Net Zero Committee in terms of you know, where they are in progress for 801 and 802 Nino's, Glen Sanex and Glen Rosa. But there are another four ferries that are being built in Kimri in, in Turkey and they are progressing well um, and in terms of progress there. So I acknowledge that. I, don't, I think it's been self-evident. A number of ministers you know, have apologised for what's happened, particularly to island communities, and I think that's self-evident. So, in a sense, there wasn't a recommendation from that conclusion, but if that gives you a reassurance that, you know, yes, we do take it very seriously, continue to take it seriously, and you know, as part of my focus as a new transport minister, uh, ferries is, uh, is, is, uh, you know, is, is definitely um, my one of my main main focuses. I, I, I want probably, and I, should, I keep having to say this, but I think I should be quite clear that um, I did refer to the fact that I was deputy convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. They spent well over a year taking evidence on ferries. Um, they produced a report. Um, I was not a member of that committee when the, the report was finally concluded. And clearly, as minister, I wanted to deliver on the uh, response that the cabinet secretary provided. But if that gives you an indication that it's probably one of the reasons why I'm in this post is to take a focus on that, if I can reassure you. On the point about responsibility, I think there's um, there's quite comprehensive setting out of the problems that um, occurred, uh, and particularly, I think, uh, initial stages of the design process, and also clearly, as you have identified, and indeed others have identified, um, relationship issues, obviously, between the two contracting parties um, did, did have its uh, challenges and difficulties. Um, I think the... And I... And I would refer back to the Rural Affairs Environment Committee's the REC report. It was very comprehensive in setting out those. It was uncomfortable reading for a lot of people, but I think it really set out. And I think your report also reflects those issues um, in terms of what the, the, the problem areas were. And anybody, and I know the committee have visited, because I've you know, we, you've <coughs> seen that from your report, visited the yard. And MD, who has, and I had on one occasion, had uh, the opportunity to visit as well um, to see the... I think it was the, the disconnect between the design and obviously the build and the, the, you know, the retrofitting that had to take place, I don't think was, was very helpful. There were other issues along the way, and I think um, in his um, response in terms of particularly, which I, obviously this committee will be interested on in spend, I thought, um, again, sometimes it's easier to reflect on things uh, separately. I thought um, David Tideman's uh, response uh, identifying some of the kind of what he saw as the difficult areas, some of it Lastly, there was obviously an element around the pandemic which has stopped progress, but that wasn't <coughs> fundamental, I think, to the initial issues. And, and in his remarks later on, um, he talks through what he sees as been the kind of key areas, and a lot of that was a design build issues right at the beginning that things were, were not done properly at that stage. I think that's well documented. And the issue then is, and I think that's where your recommendations um, and, the, the, well, and it's probably more some of the commentary that's in there, but quite clearly in recommendations from REC about what happens in terms of milestones, etc. We know that the improvements are made, and I think this committee's purpose is to make sure that the improvements have been made and will be made, and I can reassure you that there have been improvements made. Some of them were made even in advance of your committee's report, but certainly afterwards. And I think some of the things that we want to do, particularly in lessons learned, is to pull that together and identify, because some of the issues are, for example, in the, the Scottish finance you know, module and public finance module, those changes have been made, and we need to make sure you know where they are so, and, and identify where they are for some of those issues. Some of them are for CMAL and some of them are for Transport Scotland. 
that's kind of quite a wide response, but I hope I can give you some reassurance there, Convener. Okay. I, I mentioned the workforce, and I should uh, refer members to my register of uh, interests and my membership of the GMB union. But, um, I mean, do you have any reflections on uh, the role of the workforce and the extent to which they've been involved or, or uh, conversely, sidelined uh, in some of these decisions? And, I mean, I think, you know, our sense of it has been, and certainly when we visited the Yard, this was absolutely underlined, that they had a clear view of how this uh, uh, construction project should have been undertaken, um, about the configuration of the yard and the reconfiguration of the yard and so on, but they were ignored. I mean, do you have a view now on uh, the weight that should be attached uh, to that voice? So, that, again, that was um, in your report, not as a recommendation to government, uh, but as a conclusion and view of the, of the, of the committee. And you're asking for reflections on what you're, 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 not, you're not asking for a particular you know, official response to what we will do as a, a result of this. Um, this area is probably more, and I've got, and I think this is, we should, I suppose, delay the responsibilities Cle clearly from Transport Scotland, from the Scottish Minister's point of view, as, tr as Minister for Transport, you know, the responsibilities are for procurement, including of the six, you know, the four new ferries in, um, in Turkey, you know, realising the six that will be delivered by 2026. The, running of the company and the organisation uh, post nationalisation so obviously that was you know you're talking about Ferguson Marine Port Glasgow and there's that's a current responsibility which um, ultimately lies with the cabinet secretary um, for for the economy uh, pre um, nationalisation the privatised um, or the private I suppose it's the private Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited there are issues there so there are issues for two separate companies um, at different times if you're asking for my reflection about the role of workforce, um, uh, I, I certainly think that uh, the strength of um, any organisation is how it can actually involve its workforce in decision making and advice because the people who are doing the work um, are, are experts in that. And I know at different times um, it's been specifically re requested and has been delivered by the board. And of course, in the, the nationalised uh, Ferguson Marine Port Glasgow, um, the role of the board and, and impressing the importance on the board to in, involve the workforce and particularly trade union representatives on a regular basis. My understanding is that does happen. Your, your, your question is, had they been listened to earlier and sooner? And I think you're going back to the kind of even the kind of 15, 16, 17, that period as well. I can't really comment because one, I wasn't there and it was a private company at that time. But you're asking about the principle of that. And I think, is it a lessons learned that um, your know, active participation of the workforce in key, um, you know, key, I suppose, deliverables in terms of um, operation matters? Should that work? Well, that's part of the fair work approach that the government um, is committed to. I think you'd need to you know, obviously reflect, and, and you did, and you've taken evidence from the workforce as to where they've seen that in the past. I think in terms of where this government, and I would say probably under the, the new First Minister, the focus on that, and I think you've quite clearly seen that from um, the approach that the Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray has taken in this as well. So that's my, my view. Okay. I mean, the, I mean, just for the record, there were, I mean, there were um, serious concerns about the uh, uh, performance of the turnaround director who was a part of the post-nationalisation uh, project. Um, so, um, yeah, and I think, uh, as, again, my understanding is the demarcation here is that it's Neil Gray uh, who's the Cabinet Secretary re responsible for the yard. The yard. Yeah. Um, OK, well, let me move on, because time is uh, almost uh, running away with us already. Uh, and, and that is uh, what the Scottish Government's response is, uh, because we didn't get this from the previous Minister uh, for Transport. Uh, to our conclusion that there's been a significant lack of transparency and accountability through this project. And we drew attention in particular uh, to the fact that um, FMEL uh, wasn't transparent about its uh, unwillingness or inability uh, to uh, produce a full builder's uh, refund guarantee. Uh, and uh, we also think that, um, for example, it was inappropriate <coughs> Uh, during the course of a procurement, uh, a live procurement process uh, for the then uh, Transport Minister to uh, respond to uh, a, a, a regional list MSP, and that's a correction we need to make to the report, uh, that um, there had been occasions previously where a full builder's refund guarantee hadn't been necessary, and that was then taken as the green light by uh, Jim McCall and the FMEL uh, uh, leadership uh, to uh, continue with their 
bid in the tendering process. So you're reflecting not on transparency of the government at this stage, I'm sure you will at some point, but you're reflecting on the transparency of a, a, a private company, um, you know, First Marine Engineering Limited at that time, but also in terms of the exchange of those letters and was it material to their decision or, or did they use that as a decision? And you actually, I think, quite rightly in your conclusions, think that they, that would not in and of itself be you know, the green light it, and it shouldn't be. I mean, because neither the two individuals concerned were party to contract. Indeed, um, FML private, the, the private company FML would have wanted to ensure, I'm sure, you know, that they were abiding by the procurement requirements of the contracting party, which was CML, and the contracting party CML did obviously set that out in 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 what was required in terms of procurement. And, and I also should should say, and I think you're quite aware, and I think the first minister, former first minister, in her evidence um, identified that um, in terms of uh, the Transport Scotland's provision of that exchange of letters, we I think the understanding is you had that correspondence or knew of that correspondence and the content of it anyway, but the formatting meant there was a paragraph missing and also when it was sent to you, it was sent during the, the week that you were about to find like We wouldn't have known that or officials wouldn't have known that and again, that was remiss and I think that's, that's recognised, but that wasn't necessarily would have had an impact on your, your report because obviously that correspondence was, was made available. Um, and in terms of the um, the, the, the issues around uh, whether that was should have been taken as approval. Anybody who deals with contracts, legal authority, would not have taken that. The other point, uh, as as indication that that was somehow a government approval, um, in terms of what it did say, which I think was reasonable, was that there have been instances, in, in, including work at Ferguson's previously, for the hybrid vessels that were done on a different um, operator. And all, it did, all that letter did was reflect that there had been a different... Um, operating um, method previously for some of the, the, the smaller hybrid vessels that uh, Ferguson's had, had, had produced. So, um, you know, in terms of the criticism that the committee made, I think it was a fair criticism of what happened in terms of how that private company decided or gave evidence to you. That's, that's for you and the... You know, you're asking me to comment on something that I wasn't party to, so... Yeah, I mean, I think we've got we have got a particular question on that. Can I just okay, before before I, before I go to the deputy convener to 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 go uh, down that route of questioning? Can I just ask you a, again a, a kind of you've mentioned the fact that your CV includes uh, uh, deputy convenership of the Net Zero Committee, membership of the Economy Committee, and so on, but your CV also includes uh, cabinet level uh, ministerial responsibility between 2009 and 2020, which covers a large part. Uh, of the time span that we have looked at in our uh, evidence uh, collection. I mean, do you have any, uh, I mean, can you tell us as a member of the cabinet during that time, uh, w which issues around uh, Ferguson Marine Port Glasgow, which issues around Ferguson Marine, uh, as it is now constituted, came to the cabinet? I think that's a bit of an unfair question um, to expect me to have on tap the different times that it was discussed at Cabinet over that period, which was an extensive period and from some time ago. So I, I'm not really in a position to, to come back to you. I haven't got instant recall on that and I, I don't think that... It will have come at different times for, diff for, for different points and, and reported to Cabinet, uh, different progress. I, I cannot, because it was not my kind of lead responsibility at that time, um, to go through um, those, those issues, decisions that would have had to be taken would have been taken. Um, in fact, a lot of obviously the reporting will have come to Parliament in terms of ministerial statements by the relevant cabinet secretaries or um, at different times, as it as it does just now. But I, I cannot give you instant recall as to what happened um, in that 11-year period. And, and with, with respect, I'm not sure that's a. That's something to ask me in my capacity now as Minister for Transport when I'm meant to be responding to, obviously, your, your report that was published. Well, but, our, but you mentioned the former First Minister's evidence to us, yeah. and she told us that no, no formal decision was taken by the Cabinet on these matters. I mean, I mean, the, the decision to nationalise the yard, for example, was that not a Cabinet-level decision? So there's, there's different issues, and I, th I could think, again, you've, you've had the evidence, but I'll need to check on that in terms of what is the role and responsibilities of ministers and, and uh, Cabinet secretaries, the things that do need to come to Cabinet, things that don't, and um, particularly in relation, I think there's quite, you go into quite a bit in that area about the um, authorisation for, for um, you know, the approval of the uh, award of 
a word of tender and was that appropriate for a minister to make or should that have been a cabinet or at what level that would that would have made and I think you go through that quite well in your in, in your report so certain decisions will be taken at certain times and I but I just I don't, honestly I, I I I wouldn't want to mislead the committee by saying something that I that isn't true and so if I can't honestly uh, have an instant recall as to when these decisions were made I'm focusing on my evidence here to what I was asked to do which is actually not ev even evidence on the report on the you know leading up to your report it's your request for a response to the Scottish government's existing response in May 2023. Yeah I mean it is a question though of, of uh, transparency and openness and how government dealt with this and I think that the you know there is a uh, I think a legitimate uh, quite I mean for example we were told by uh, the uh, now DG for net zero uh, Mr Brannan told us that uh, decisions would go to cabinet of the gravity and scale was his expression of ScotRail being nationalized so I'm, I'm just trying to understand whether the decision to nationalize the yard at uh, Port Glasgow would have been a cabinet level decision so I don't know if anybody who is probably more familiar with that would re recall. I, um, as far as I understand it, no, that was that was not a, a cabinet decision. That would have been a ministerial decision at the time. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I mean, and I think that's in your. I don't think that's new. I think that was in your report as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to bring in the deputy convener, okay. Sharon. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Uh, the majority of the committee concluded that the former Minister for Transport and Islands showed poor judgment in responding to an MSP about alternatives to builders refund guarantees during a live procurement process. Are there any lessons for the Scottish Government to learn from this? Um, I, I, think, I think clearly as the whole of this process is, including from the, you know, the conclusions of not just your own committee but the Auditor General's report and also from the Economy Committee, um, so the uh, REC Committee, there are lots of lessons to be learned. I think the, the, that exchange, reading that now, um, it's quite clear that the Minister for Transport, the then Minister for Transport, was reflecting on what had actually what had happened before, that there had been instances at the yard, which also at that time the you know, private Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited would have known about, um, that there had been. Uh, situations where you know things had developed without a builder's guarantee, so that that was a reflection. It wasn't advice as to what would happen in a ongoing, you know, in a in a in, a, in a, another procurement. It was reflecting on on the past. But do you think it was appropriate at all for him to even communicate, considering he was the minister? I mean, so, so many things are judgment calls. I mean, I think it's very really you know on, on hindsight, a lot of things you might not want to do or, or, or rethink again. Um, you know, in terms of communicating during live procurements, I try and avoid it. I mean, I've not had that much, you know, in the last in recent times. But you know, I think there's kind of that safety first thing. But uh, you've also then have got MSPs who demand to have responses to the letters, and if they don't get responses, they'll stand up in Parliament and say, "Why haven't you responded to my letter?" So that's the kind of call you want transparency and openness, which is again what the, you're asking for. So it's a judgment call. He made that judgment. You know, in terms of looking back on that, you know, had he known what he does now, would he have done the same thing? I don't, I don't know. But I think, in terms of the content, because it was about a factual reflection of what had happened, as opposed to an opinion on a, on a procurement, it was in that he probably saw. I mean, I don't want to second guess how somebody decides things or judges it, but that's my reflections on that. And I think what I think the committee is looking for has just been some, and that's what you're doing is reflections on your conclusions, as opposed to. You know, as responding as to what we will, what we're being asked to do um, as a government now. So is it fair to say that we've no learnt lessons then? Because if that was asked in Parliament, then you would normally get the response of, "It's a live case, I can't comment. It's a live procurement exercise, I can't comment." So, from your answer, I'm, I'm guessing that there hasn't been any instruction given out to any ministers saying that they can't comment in any. Well, normally the advice is not to, to do something that would cause any issues involved in a procurement. That's what you would normally get in, in terms of um, you know, when the letter comes up or the letter comes in. But I don't know, Colin, do you want to reflect? Because you've obviously do probably more of this on the economy side of things. No, I mean, just to, just to re reaffirm what you, you said, um, Minister, I mean, typically um, we wouldn't issue any public statements in the middle of a, a procurement exercise for, for, for obvious reasons, but this is a... I mean, this is not something that uh, we, I don't think there's been a case of us actually having to reaffirm that guidance to anybody, but uh, I can look into that. So would you reaffirm the guidance to 
Scottish Government officials or would you reaffirm the guidance to ministers? Well, I can, I can talk from a, a, an official's point of view, and we wouldn't uh, typically make public statements about any procurement when it's live, because it's obviously important uh, that that process is followed um, appropriately. And I, and I would get, as a minister, I would get advice from saying, look, you know, this minute the MSP is written in, we're in a live situation. You know, and I've got that, do I see, and, you know, under, um, for example, there's a number of... Um, it's not in this area, but PSOs, you know, like for um, you know, there's a lot of, and I've had MSPs want to speak to me about it, they want to write to me about it, and some of those issues we're not party to, it's actually other parties, but we don't want to interfere within procurement that are actually for other parties as well, it's not even just with government, so, and normally ministers would accept advice that's given to them um, in terms of the drafting of the letter. Okay, thanks. Um, the majority of the committee also concluded that it was unclear why the former minister told us he had no knowledge of the preferred bidder before going on annual leave, when evidence from the former Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities stated that he was aware. Correspondence from Transport Scotland issued after the report was agreed appears to support the former Cabinet Secretary's position. So is the Scottish Government any clearer whether the former Minister was aware who the preferred bidder was before going on annual leave? Um, right. I think I need to reflect and work out, you know, the, 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 the sort of the chain of events and the, the evidence that you have in that. Again, that wasn't something that was a recommendation to me as a current Transport Minister for action, unless it was if, if officials have got better recall of that. So the only thing that I would respond back to you is that you've heard from the former Transport Minister and his position. Um, you've seen the evidence that's um, that's been put in front of you in terms of that exchange. Um, so, so you've got that there. Um, it's not for us to make a judgment on what what, what you've been told. Okay, thanks. So, so one of the questions that was why the correspondence was received late, because it took a freedom of information before the committee actually saw the... Right, so the my understanding, and I'll ask officials to, to work... And actually, can I just say, you know, as, um, as, as a minister, I expect my officials in whatever portfolio, and certainly in this one, to, you know, to respect Parliament and committees' for, you know, requests for information. I think what happened in that was that there was about press... I think you took, there was a conclusion about press lines or, or approval of a press line for the minister. Um, and that was identified um, when it, with an FOI that came from another route. And as soon as it was, it was given to your committee. It, there was no kind of intent not to give it to your committee or somehow you know, not provide it. And I think the issue is that it came in at the same time as you were concluding your, your report. And again, because officials wouldn't have no idea when you were concluding your report, they wouldn't know it was late. Um, if that makes sense, I mean, although I know you've taken a long time over this, um, so that's my understanding of the explanation. I don't think it was accept you know, that's acceptable, but I think that's again improvements of trying to identify record keeping, which again, you know, as part of the government's response, they, that has happened um, in terms of trying to locate things. But there's a huge amount of information that Transport Scotland have provided for not just your committee, but also particularly the the REC committee. Um, so is, is that my correct recollection of that I process? Think, I, I, th I think so, Minister. I would just, just echo the points that it's regrettable. We didn't find that the first time round a method. We've provided quite uh, significant bundles of information to the committee, particularly following the First Minister's appearance, uh, and that was one of the questions that you, you had asked in that. Um, there is a huge volume of material, as you, as you would expect, a lot of which has been published uh, in this space. Uh, it was only when we had a separate uh, follow-up, uh, a separate FOI, that this, this piece was identified. And as soon as it was identified, I asked the team to, to send it on to the committee. Uh, regrettably, that was, as we now know, at the point you, you concluded your yeah. report. So. Okay. So one of the other bits as well, just looking at the accountability, is that um, there was a verbal briefing that was listed for Transport Scotland. So I'll just read it. The minister had received a verbal briefing before he'd went on annual leave. So I'm just wondering whether your record keeping, and there is more questions that will be asked later on in record keeping, but have you improved your procedures? Are all like, verbal briefings now recorded somewhere so that as far as accountability is concerned, we actually know who said what to who when? 
So um, I, I can maybe usefully um, comment on that, having come back into government after two years, and um, I can see quite evidently that there's more record keeping on issues around verbal briefing. You'd have a note, I've met such and such, and we're briefed on such and such, etc. Um, but actually, I, you know, it's quite evident to me that um, you know there is, uh, and I think um, an improved record keeping process. We, again, we, we, we say that in the response to to the committee, and I think the permanent secretary, I think the new permanent secretary, have made it quite clear that across government, not just in this area, but across government, there needs to be um, improved record keeping of, of everywhere. And so, can I just say, I spend a lot of time clearing minutes of meetings. No, so, if I can reassure, reassure you of that. So I've got more questions in record keeping. I might come back in later on. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. I mean, just to uh, Mr. Cook's um, response there. I mean, the evidence that we took uh, from Mr. Mackay was that the letter he signed to Mr. McMillan had been prepared by his officials, um, um, and uh, to Mr. Wilcock, um, the request for that information was made by the committee. Um, of uh, Transport Scotland in November 2022, uh, and it finally uh, saw the light of day in March 2023, but following an FOI trawl, not because the department had been sufficiently adept at finding it for us when we first asked for it back in November. And I have to, and and it, it wasn't the, it wasn't a one off, and I think that's there was a pattern there which Mr. Beatty I think will speak about shortly. Yeah, I mean, and I, was, I think you know draft press lines are not necessarily the same you know as meetings of decisions etc and that's why i think i mean i just I, I can see how that might have happened but i think record keeping of everything that is of significance and i think that's the point is it what is of significance in terms of decision making and who knew what when etc and there's far more acute awareness of that now than there would have been previously Okay, um, these themes we, we shall return to. Uh, Graeme Simpson's got some questions to put. <clears throat> Thanks very much, convener, and good morning. Um, I, I just want to follow up uh, briefly on uh, Sharon Dowie's line of questioning around this uh, builder's refund guarantee and Kevin Stewart's response, um, in which he mentions the UK government's... So at the time he wrote the response in May, the UK government was planning to introduce a home shipbuilding credit guarantee scheme. Uh, and Mr Stewart uh, said in his letter to the committee that he uh, awaited uh, the final details. Uh, he would work with industry to establish how best to utilise the scheme and maximise its potential. Well, it was, it, it was actually launched two months after he wrote the letter. So my question is, has, has the government, has the Scottish government engaged with the UK government on its shipbuilding credit guarantee scheme? So in, in terms of, of that, I might you know, refer to officials as, as to what sort of official engagement there is. Um, if you're saying, you know, in terms of uh, his letter on the 23rd of May, that you're saying that in terms of that time scale, in the last few weeks, we should have been engaging with the UK government on the shipbuilding guarantee. Um, I personally have not, but I would okay. expect my officials to um, do that either very promptly um, or have already done that. I do think it's quite a, a helpful um, intervention. I suppose it's how it's used. I think the issues, and I think it'll tie in, in fact, both yourself and um, uh, Colin Beattie will be aware, you know, from the time on the Economy Committee, subsidy control issues have been developing in terms of um, what can what can and cannot happen, particularly in a kind of post Brexit situation, and how we can have um, you know support for procurement and support for domestic um, entities, and so therefore it's a, a it's a welcome intervention, but it will have taken some time to develop. We need to work out um, what we do in terms of that. Um, and in terms of the operation and the underpinning, because it's an, obviously it's an underwriting issue, and therefore a lot of that will depend on where we've got capacity as a government to do underwriting and where's the source of that that funding. And in terms of uh, relation to borrowing, we know we've had improvement for borrowing for revenue purposes. And um, some of these issues might be in relation to capital, which will in a, well it will have challenges for us, which will be different from the UK government. So that's the sort of thing we'll need to explore. But can I maybe ask um, if officials have had or are intend to have those discussions with the UK government on this? Uh, it's a, so it wouldn't be uh, my, my part of Transport Scotland, but I suspect perhaps the Yard or Economy colleagues may have... So 
those issues would be between you know in terms of future procurement and what could happen in terms of that depending who had that so therefore you're looking then in terms of the bidders um the, you're looking at the kind of the people who are bidding for the work having that um, underpinning and guarantee and in which case it would be a yard or whatever yard well the scheme the scheme was launched in july uh -huh. so you know the government's had a, a a bit of time to engage with its uk counterparts at least to find out the details and, and how it could help in the future. Um, That's why I you know, in terms of your recommendations, that that is a good recommendation. Yeah. We want the government to, to respond to it. And certainly in my detailed uh, examination of your report, going through what is a conclusion, what's a recommendation, what do we have to act on, um, that was something that certainly in my new position in post, because obviously I wouldn't have looked at it at the time that you produced it with that level of detail, um, that I think that's a good and useful recommendation and my officials will act on it. Okay, well that's that, that, that's good to know. Now now I've alerted them to the uh, scheme being in existence. You can make make contact. I want to move on to. Um, well, as I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll move on to something else. Um, so you'll have seen, I'm sure you watched as I did, the disclosure Scotland programme um, around this whole issue. I think it was um, a, a year and a day. Uh, ago that it was uh, actually broadcast uh, and the allegation in, in that program essentially was that the whole procurement process was rigged that was the word that was used in, in the program um, and then we had the appointment of Barry Smith KC um, who was appointed to look um, at the allegations made in, in, in the program but it's been reported that Mr. Smith has not been asked to look at whether the contract was rigged, but was instead asked to look at whether there was fraud. That's not what I'm saying. This has been reported in the press. So is that, tr is that accurate? I mean, what, what has he been asked to do? Well, I can't comment on what's been reported in the press. Um, I, what I can tell you is that, quite rightly and appropriately, um, the CML board had appointed... Uh, Mr. Smith to carry out that um, investigation. I think that's uh, they have got responsibilities to do that. And to my understanding is that they were looking at all the allegations that were made in that um, in that programme by the BBC. Um, it's important that the the review obviously that they have to that has to be presented to them and they have to review that and publish it. And they've committed to do that. And I think that's the appropriate thing to do. So it, has he been asked to look at? Uh, whether there was fraud, because nobody's alleged that. Well, I, again, it's the issues about you know, what the allegations are, and that um, in terms of uh, that's an issue really for the CMR board, what they've asked them to look at, and they're perfectly entitled to commission that, which they have done. I think it's a responsibility to do that, which they have done. Um, and I, and I as, as you do, will be interested to see the report when it's published. So do you or your officials know what his remit is? So... What CMAL have asked Barry Smith to undertake is to do a review of all the allegations made in the BBC um, Disclosures Programme. And the focus is on whether or not the process was arranged or influenced in a way that was dishonest or fraudulent. So, to my mind, while it's a matter for CMAL, that sounds to me like an all-encompassing review of the important issues that were raised um, in the BBC report. OK. Um, when are we going to see this report? That's a matter for the CMR board. I, would, I think it'll be fairly soon. <laughs> so, it's, it's, so I, I mean, again, I'm not responsible for the timescale for that. But CMR, CMR report to you, or, or your colleague Neil Gray. They report to the government. It's a CMR report to the CMR board. And do we, then do we know when we're going to see this report? I mean, the minister says soon, but that could mean anything. So, so we, we are not party to that. We do know that the KC has undertaken the um, interviews that they were looking at, but what we haven't seen um, is any form of finding from that. And the fact that that's right and proper, because that report is going to be directed to the CMAL board. Uh, and depending on the findings of that work will depend on what actions are taken next. And will the report be made public? Uh, I think the intention is that it will be published in some form. Yeah, I, mean, I think the CMAL chief executive was 
pretty clear that they intend to publish as much of it as they possibly can. They'll obviously need to take into account any um, relevant personal information or any other elements there. But that, certainly Kevin Hobbs has been pretty clear they are keen to publish as full an account of it as they can. I, I guess the other thing I would add uh, in, in relation to this is uh, a relevant point is that we, both ourselves and, and CMAL and, and wider government have said that and uh, understand the Auditor General has said that he will review that report when it is completed and the findings of that, that work to identify whether any further audit work is required. And we, we are absolutely committed to, to engaging with that if, if further work is, uh, is identified. Uh, would, would there, for example, once it's published, be a ministerial statement? I think, it, I think it's up to the board to publish the content of the report. We need to review the content of the report, and then that would be a judgment at the time whether that merited or in, you know, and I can't, I can't prejudge what the content is, so I can't tell you what happens after it's produced. Okay. Okay, uh, just to um, underscore that the uh, recommendation of the committee was that that uh, investigation should be carried out thoroughly, but also urgently. And uh, as Mr Simpson said, it's, um, it's uh, a year since the programme was, uh, was broadcast. Can I just go to a, a, another um, uh, question which was uh, uh, identified in the report that we produced, which we didn't really get a response to by your predecessor, uh, Minister? Uh, and, and so I wonder now whether you would respond to the concerns that the committee expressed about the decision to publicly announce the preferred bidder uh, on the 31st of August 2015, uh, when I think the expression used was significant negotiations had still to be concluded. So again, this is a, a conclusion and a, a position taken by the committee, which obviously that's part of your responsibility to set out what your your position, what your view is on that. In terms of the appropriateness of that, I think that was something you went into some detail with the, the former First Minister um, as well, and you've got good evidence as to, to where that was. Um, in terms of that, uh, of that timing, I think that's been laid out. I think it's been laid out a number of times as to, to you know, when that was in terms of the appropriateness of that. But what's the government's response to it? Because we didn't get a response from Mr Stewart, so we're asking you this morning what the government's response to that is. I mean, I think the government response is, is, uh, is that it was appropriate for the government to make um, an announcement because that is something that would have happened in previous contexts. It would have happened in relation to um, allocation of contracts elsewhere. For example, when CalMac you know, received its... Um, allocation of that tender, so it would be appropriate for the government to make that announcement once the, the process had gone through. I think the issue is, and your, your, what your report tries to, you know, try, tries to, to, to set out, is that you know, had everything concluded or was that, an, was that a premature announcement? I think it was appropriate at the time, but that, therefore, you know, in terms of the evidence you've had, you've had different views and different opinions, and, that, and that's going to happen on the hindsight as to, to where that where that was at the time. So the government's position is you would just do the same all over again? No, uh, that's not that's not what I'm saying. You obviously have to judge it at the, the point in time where you know the, the 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 work that's been carried out has 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 been you know assessed and, and the and the, the procurement process has gone through. I do I do think again this is the kind of point about looking back to something that, that took place a significant time ago. The changes that have taken place since then um prior to even the recommendations of REC and also your own recommendations to improve the processes of procurement. It also means um, investment decision making is in a different process than it would have been at that point. So it's quite difficult to kind of view something retrospectively with the lens that we currently have as a government as to what's appropriate. And so I'm saying we, we would, you know, looking back, the types of processes that we have now would have been in place at that point, but obviously weren't because we've learned from that and that's why we've improved processes going forward. I think we've been quite open about that. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll come on to the business investment uh, framework shortly. Can I ask you then about another issue around transparency? And that is uh, the meeting that took place be between the former First Minister and Jim McCall on the 31st of May 2017, uh, at which there were no permanent civil servants present. Do you have a view on that? Does the Scottish Government have a view on that? 
So I think, again, in terms of the evidence of that, that was responded to by the government at the time and by the, the, the witnesses you had at the time. Um, what we've also said in the response and was said in the, the May response is it is important to keep minutes and, and records of all, all meetings and that's what does happen and that, that's appropriate. But you accept there is there was no uh, minute uh, produced my, or found of that. There's a record of the decision because my understanding is, and again, it's from the evidence that was set out, and you've got that evidence in your report and your your the sessions that you had, was that there was an email exchange following that that made it quite clear what the result of that meeting was. So the record of it was there, but not in the form that you would normally have as a minute of a meeting. It was an exchange afterwards. But and and does the Scottish government have a view on a minister? meeting a private contractor uh, at which no permanent civil servants are present? Well, there was, um, as you know, there was a, an official there. A special, special advisor, advisor, I think we were told. Advisor. But not a permanent civil servant. So in terms of, um, in, in terms of how we would normally operate, it clearly, um, and I think actually, to be fair, as, as was set out, um, in the evidence sessions that the, the Scottish Government has been as accessible and approachable to, to interests as it can be, but in an appropriate way. Um, and as long as things are documented, um, clearly this was documented, but not in the form that would probably currently happen, which would be an official minute. Yeah, but I mean, but the, the former First Minister said to us, and I quote her, officials have been unable to lo locate a note of this meeting. OK, well, I'll, I'll maybe just um, reflect that uh, my understanding was there was, and as, as given to the, the committee and, and a lot of the you know, extensive documentation, that there was an email exchange that reported that. So we could, again, um, I think you've got it in the, in the evidence you have, but we can obviously make sure that if it's we want to refresh the committee's memory of it, we can provide you that again. OK, well, that would be helpful, but it does sound a bit like we would do the same again. I don't think I've said that. I think I've been at pains to say that when you're part of the response that you have had, and what I've said is um, I'm quite clear that there has been improvements in record keeping. There have been recommendations, particularly from the new permit secretary, about how, um, how decisions and how things are recorded should be made. And in terms of uh, your minute taking, I, I have observed that improvement in my recent weeks coming back into government. OK. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on just to a, a, another area where there has been uh, some uh, public interest, and that is uh, about uh, who in the end uh, was responsible for signing off uh, the contract, because we've, we've seen in Mr Wilcox alludes to the 200-and-odd uh, documents that have been released by the government, which included email exchanges where John Swinney's officials spoke about banana skins and all the rest of it. So it, there seemed to be, and the, 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 there still appears to be, some confusion over who in the end uh, signed the contract off. Was it Derek Mackay? Was it Keith Brown? Was it John Sweeney? And so on. I mean, has the, has the government uh, drawn any lessons from that uh, observation of the committee? Well, I'll, I'll provide an initial response and then I'll, I'll bring in um, Alison, particularly about you know, what happens now, but also in, in, in reflection. So clearly the contract itself, and I think it's really important to set this out, is, was between CMAL um, as the, the procuring uh, authority and the private company Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited. It was obviously a use of public funds, and so therefore in terms of the uh, decision to approve that, then that would need to be uh, provided by the relevant ministers. Now, obviously, the Minister for Transport would have a degree of authorisation or kind of approval, but they would not be party to the contract. In terms of any major spend, um, and, you know, especially in, and I can reflect now, and particularly in very tight fiscal circumstances, you know, the, the authorising um, officer currently is, that's a, has, a, has a key role, but clearly the Finance Secretary and any major spend um, has to identify have we got resources to do this, not from a, is it the merits of the individual case, but in the points of you know, can the government afford this in terms of you know, its wider, wider spend. So hopefully that gives you a kind of the, 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 sh the shape of it. But Alison, do you want to reflect on anything either then or now in terms of that process? Um, so if I, if I take the then piece, I'm aware that you heard quite extensive evidence from Mr Brannan when he appeared um, in front of the committee about the role of decision making with ministers and the difference in the relationships between Mr Mackay, Mr Brown and Mr Swinney. So I'm happy to clarify anything specific that you're, that you're seeking further clarification on. Uh, but just to kind of reiterate the position uh, as it would be now, 
that um, for the decision associated with the procurement of a new vessel, that would be something that would be considered, that would be presented to, by CMAL to Transport Scotland in terms of a business case. We would consider that business case as a, as a senior management team and off the back of that, put advice to the Minister for Transport and it would be the Minister for Transport who would give the authorisation subject to sufficient budget to recover um, um, for that procurement to proceed and that information would be passed to CMAL and they would remain the contracting authority. Okay. I mean, I know that Mr Brannan was absolutely clear to pin responsibility on uh, Mr Mackay. I think our uh, observations as a committee were that there appeared to be uh, more hands on the tiller than just uh, Mr uh, Mackay's at the time of the decision. And it was, uh, as you say, Minister, um, we know that it wasn't a ministerial name on the contract, but it did require ministerial authorisation, which makes it quite important to us to understand uh, who was responsible. And as I say, we, uh, I, we, um, we are interested to find out what lessons have been learned from that and, and how we can get more clarity into what is actually a very important decision uh, and uh, has become more important as hindsight has uh, progressed. So, so if I may, sure. if I, may I, I was trying to provide that clarity that in terms of the process that has followed that the responsibility for the decision on the procurement of vessels is for the Minister for Transport, subject to the financial provisions being in place. So uh, yeah. I just wanted to yeah. check that you were comfortable but, with but, that. But, but, but it's not even uh, clear, Ms Irvin, whether, um, whether Mr Mackay was on holiday and so Mr Brown signed it all. I mean, the, 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 all I'm saying is there, was a, the, there continues to be a degree of confusion about that process and, and where the authorisation uh, lay. Um, I'm going to bring in Mr Beattie, who's got uh, a number of questions which I think develop this theme on Transport Scotland's role. Colin. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Minister. Um, I'd like to explore a little bit about the role of Transport Scotland. And I mean, from the report, it'll be clear that the role of Transport Scotland was seriously called into question in the course of the report. Uh, just to mention a couple of things, uh, the project steering group which was led by Transport Scotland, was seen to be weak and ineffectual. Transport Scotland officials failed to communicate some quite important information to Scottish ministers on CMAL's behalf. No references made in the Scottish Government's response to these concerns. Would you be able to take the opportunity now to respond to these concerns about Transport Scotland? So again, I, I read the comment that obviously there are clear recommendations from the report and there's clear asks of governments and that's what the response from Kevin Stewart on May 2023 identified clearly throughout the report. There are statements made by the, co the committee quite rightly in terms of you know, what your view is of and what your conclusions of um, certain situations are and you've taken a view on Transport Scotland. Um, in terms of uh, I suppose it's the clarity of understanding that, that's sought about what is the role, well, what was the role then, and what is the role now of Transport Scotland. And you know, in terms of uh, that work, clearly Transport Scotland um, advise government, and they provide information. And I think there was information being provided, but we have formalised that far more. So, for example, in relation to CMAL's advice and information to us about what's happening in Turkey in relation to the four vessels, I hear that directly. And I have regular um, conversations directly with CMAL. I'm obviously work with Transport Scotland colleagues on that. But in terms of the, the management of that contract and the, the parties to that contract, that was quite clearly um, the, the private for Ferguson Marie's Energy um, Engineering Limited and CMAL, as I've, I've said previously. Um, so in terms of that information, informations do flow. They're far more formalised and probably far more direct now than they were previously. In relation to the project steering group, I suppose the issue is what, is, what was their role then and also in relation to what is their role now. And again, um, to help kind of go unpick that in detail, you can have criticisms of what have happened before and that's perfectly possible. You know, that's what you've set out in your... In, in your report, in terms of government, we weren't asked to comment on that, so I've given you a view just now. And Alison, can you maybe explain what was the, or Chris, whoever's more appropriate, the, the role of the project steering group then, and what is the, the role of project steering groups now in relation to, to this type of work? Yeah, so, so I, th I think, Minister, I'd probably start with the reflection of we have a very different process now and how we alert ministers. I think the 
the observations and criticisms uh, picked up in the REC report and, and the alluded to here, where that that committee, or sorry, the the NSPSG was receiving reports and not passing those timidly to to ministers. I think we'd probably dispute that we we didn't share information with ministers. There is a question around how that was recorded and and the timing of that and the point at which we formally escalated that. I think in December 2017. I can't remember the exact date. For, forgive me for that. Um, now, however, there is a very different process around sharing information with ministers. So the minister will get uh, the quarterly reports along with uh, Mr Gray for uh, 801 and 802 or whichever frequency those reports come in. Uh, we also share immediately as, as we receive the reports from CMAL uh, on the Shemri vessels. Again, those go directly to ministers, whether things are going well or, or otherwise, so that we can see how things are, our ministers can see how things are progressing. NSPSG, um, we are still working on the reform of that group, but I think it's fair to say we've we've made quite significant changes since uh, since the kind of 2015 period, uh, trying to move that into a kind of more functioning uh, functional uh, focused decision making rather than an information sharing space. Perhaps with some other groups below it, that's still a work in progress, but it is something that we are we are looking at. And I think it would reflect on some of the more recent decisions that that group has taken uh, in the strategic space around. Um, the recommendation to ministers to split the sky triangle, uh, the recommendation to retain a resilience vessel and to have 801 and 802 working on, on the Arran route. That's something where I think that's that, that's how I would like to shape and see that group working in the future is taking those high level strategic recommendations to put to, to put to ministers. I'm pleased to hear that uh, you know there's we've learned lessons from this and that uh, you know improvements have been put in place. But of course we're looking back here to see what happened. And would you agree that, uh, and, and it's a question for Transport Scotland, I guess, would you agree that, in fact, ministers were left somewhat blind to what was going on during the initial stages because of uh, the, the lack of reporting from Transport Scotland? Correct. Well, I'll ask Transport Scotland to review that, but having looked again and read your report and read the REC report and read through it, I think information was shared, uh, but you'll have improvements made, yes, but uh, I think you wanted to direct that question to Transport Scotland. I, I'm not sh sure I would agree with that characterisation. I think we set out an evidence to to the committee when, when we appeared, uh, just to reflect on some of those reports that were going to NSPSG suggesting there were challenges with the project, but also setting out that, uh, certainly at the earlier stages, that the Yard and CML were working on solutions and that there was the point of, of recovery. Uh, again, in reflection, would we, would we share more detail with ministers now? Well, yes, we absolutely, we absolutely do, whether things are going well or whether or not challenges are, are appearing. Would you agree that the project steering group, which was led by Transport Scotland, was in fact ineffectual? It, it wasn't. I, I think it depends what you, you expect its role to have been. Is probably it, how that would be. That could be yeah. answered different ways, depending what you think its role uh, should should have been. Yeah, I and mean, I think we were clear it wasn't party to the contract. It didn't have the opportunity to intervene when things went wrong. Again, I think we set this out in, in some of our some of our, of our evidence. It was never intended to be a, a conduit to manage those kind of difficulties. I think the. The observations and the issues that have been brought in the role of NSPSG was that escalation point to ministers, uh, and could that have been more formalised or, or improved? I think that's almost a moot point, given, as I say, uh, can we repeat the issue, uh, the point that we now directly report uh, as we go along uh, the, the issues to ministers and the progress, uh, good or bad, uh, with, with the, the, the current vessels. expectation among the participating uh, stakeholders that the project steering group had a strong role in this, which did not exist. I think it might there might there might be an expectation from the contracting parties because clearly there was a breakdown in, in the how how that was working that contract between those two two contracting parties. But you know, in terms of the Transport Scotland not being party to the contract, then what they were looking at is you know in terms of um, support for a process that needed needed support. During the, the whole process, Transport Scotland obviously had a, a member on the board or attending the board meetings of CMAL. How, how did that reporting line work back to Transport Scotland from that individual and then feed back to the Scottish Government? 
Chris, are you okay? happy to answer that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so I think it's important to note that that individual was on the board as the sp in the sponsor role, um, rather than directly discussing issues on, on, on the vessels. There would have been incidences where um, someone was attending the board and these matters would be discussed. Uh, but equally so, that person would have been very clear, uh, and I know that because I was in that role at a, at a point in time, uh, that if there were issues with this, those had to be discussed with Transport Scotland formally, uh, and that's where those discussions uh, and decisions, uh, were, or sorry, those discussions were taking place with my predecessor uh, in my current role uh, and uh, the, the director of, of ferries uh, or AMFC, as it, as it would have been then. So, so that that really is just in the sponsorship um, role, attending the board um, to, to kind of engage with, um, just just engage on, on that basis. It wouldn't be directly discussing uh, discussing those issues. The board papers would also be shared with other members in the team, but I think, as is evident, there were focused discussions and uh, the CMAL Transport Scotland liaison space was where those issues were being taken forward. Do you consider that Transport Scotland's uh, role uh, in providing uh, you know, the sponsor team support, do you think that was successful? So, so can I maybe pick this up and just to kind of try and, and take this into the how have we learned the lessons kind of territory from, from that. So the, the sponsorship role uh, within Transport Scotland, there are a number of bodies that we are the sponsoring um, authority for. Um, I became the interim chief executive in March of this year and subsequent to me taking up that post, what I've done with the sponsorship team is to try to bring all of that kind of sponsorship and liaison work together so that I am hearing directly from the sponsors on a monthly basis of the issues that are raised um, as part of that sponsorship process as a way of driving improvements uh, in the way in which both um, information is shared within the organisation, but also the point at which the level of risk um, is, is then shared with ministers. So, so again, that's not to, to take away from the, the, the criticisms and comments that have been made about the performance of Transport Scotland and the various different structures that we had in place. But I hope that you take that as a degree of assurance that we are continuing to improve um, on the way in which we manage some, some quite um, important and valuable assets for the country to see that uh, improvements have been made and lessons have been learned, but we are looking at the historical situation and the role, for example, of Transport Scotland as a sponsor in this particular instance. And do you, do you think that role was successful? I think, I think we need to say, the, so the sponsorship is of CMAL, of, as the or, or, organisation. So the issue is the sponsorship of CMAL as the organisation. The issues around CMAL, surely in the sponsorship role, you'd be picking that up and, where necessary, feeding it back to ministers. I think there's, as Alison's pointed out there, we now have clearly distinct separate roles there where the sponsorship and the policy function sit in two different directorates in Transport Scotland now. You, previously, those sat together. Uh, within the same within the same team, we've now, we've now separated that out. I, I think again, though, it's, it's the same issue that would be being raised. That the issues that were being escalated by the policy team, either via the NSPSG or those direct engagements with ministers, as we've kind of set out in, in, in our responses and in the papers that we've published, it's the same message that would be communicated, whether it be from the sponsorship side or the or the policy side. You'd be reporting the same the same issue, which which we did. Mm. Just moving on from the sponsorship, because clearly, you know, there is a question mark over that. The, during the scrutiny, Transport Scotland uh, came in for some criticism in terms of the uh, uh, attendance at times to give evidence, but also late and incomplete information being received from Transport Scotland with little explanation as to why that is. And that led the committee to, and I'm quoting, question the level of respect and regard for accountability and parliamentary scrutiny, unquote. Now, it's it, was, it, it also issued important evidence to the committee on the day after the report was agreed, meaning it couldn't be used to, to better inform the report's conclusions. 
It, does that show evidence of respect and regard for parliamentary scrutiny? So I, I took that part of your um, report very seriously to, to look at what had happened. And so I kind of, again, in my sort of detailed examination of the process and also um, asked what happened. Um, I've also made it quite clear that I always expect and um, I'm, I'm sure across government we, we must expect that there's cooperation when required and attendance. I think it seems it seems to be that um, the situation boils down to one um, absence um, uh, at a request, and that was for um, the then I think it was the interim director general who had already I think at, at some point he, he you know his, his evidence has already been referred to, so he had appeared before the committee. So I understand my reading of it, and the explanation is that there was um, you had two previous uh, interim chief executives uh, appear, and also other senior officials, and I think. Um, Chris had been uh, appeared before you as well. Um, you had one session that was very long and extensive, and you decided to have a second one. And it was at the point that that, that the the um, uh, the then I'm trying to remember the, the, what title he would have been at the time, the interim uh, interim, in, interim director general, um, couldn't come to that second meeting that you'd, you'd requested, but. Pr but said that it could come to another one and try to get alternative dates. So that's one instance. So you refer to some, and I'm not sure if there's any other instances where an official didn't appear. That was one instance, and that, that was the explanation. On the issue of the not providing complete um, information, I think we've already actually, I think, with uh, Sharon Dowie's uh, questioning, addressed there, was, there were two issues. There was the, the letter um, exchange between the former uh, transport minister and the regional MSP and the identification that there was a paragraph for formatting that had been left off. That's, you know, that's an admin mistake that shouldn't have happened. And the, the apology was given. And also that um, the press lines or the draft press lines um, that was subsequently found through another route and was surprised. Obviously, I can understand the committee's um, point of view is that if it arrived the day after you finalised your report, but Transport Scotland wouldn't have known the date that you were finalising your report. And as soon as it was found, I accept the explanation that was sent to you. So those are the, the instances. Um, I don't know if there are any other instances, and that's seen as the kind of a generalisation that it was you know, a, a number of officials not appearing or, or far more um, pieces of information than those that have been identified and referred to. Um, but that's my understanding of it. And I think that, however regrettable um, it was and apologies were given, I don't think it was in any means a way of obf of, you know, obfuscation or anything like that. And I certainly, as Minister, would not expect that from any official at any point. And I, and I respect the officials didn't do that at the time. Thanks for that clarification, which leads me on neatly to issues around rec record keeping. Um, the committee concluded in paragraph 47 of its report that record and note keeping of meetings throughout the vessels project involving Scottish ministers was, I quote, weak and fell well short of the standards of transparency and accountability that we would expect. Um, the government, uh, in its response, uh, noted that, uh, you know, further, well, further guidance has been issued, I believe, and that all parties continue to make improvement in the record keeping and so on. Um, can you provide any detail of what these improvements have involved in terms of record keeping since the report was published? So um, in, I've already, I think, addressed this issue and in, in other questioning that record keeping has improved. It's not that there weren't records, it obviously wasn't to the satisfaction of the level it could have been and there were specific ad identification of meetings that were identified in, in your report as it was, I think they, as they were with the REC committee report as well. Um, I do think that um, ensuring that uh, records of not just of meetings but of decisions taking, I think that's the, the, the kind of critical issue, have improved. Um, I don't know whether there's you know, in terms of uh, what the permit secretary has issued to um, to the civil service themselves, I understand there has been communication that that should happen. I think it's happened and been improving over a number of years, and it is quite difficult to do reflecting of what happened eight years ago as to what's happening now, and also improvements along the way. But I think the the new permit secretary, as I said 
in answer to another question, have been, has been quite clear as to what the expectation is. Um, so in terms of that pr production of that, I don't know whether any officials want to reflect what the changes are and how that's been communicated. If you've... So I, I can pick up, um, just add a bit more detail. So the Minister's already talked through the minuting of meetings and the impact that um, that is having on record keeping, etc. The other important aspect um, comes from when officials provide advice up to ministers and when we get response back from ministerial teams and private offices, there is very clear statement at the top of the, the, the response back that says that this, uh, and I'll not get the words um, exactly correct, but that this forms part of the, uh, a ministerial decision and so should be part of the official record and it's the responsibility of officials uh, to store that appropriately uh, and, and that um, is part of what I would call a, a very detailed but very helpful way in ensuring that officials are really clear about what should be kept um, as contemporaneous and significant um, record keeping um, for um, prosperity. I can add that I personally have a, a, a strong view on this because I was the minister that took forward the legislation about record management systems um, for public bodies. Um, you know, and you know that was for a specific that was stemmed from a specific purpose in relation to um, um, a, a, a very sad situation affecting uh, children that had been in care and their records had been lost. And I felt very strongly about that, that we should always have records. That was in a different circumstance. That has implications for all public bodies. And obviously, in terms of that management system, obviously for retrieval, which is obviously one of these issues, you have to have a record management system that enables that uh, retrieval. And uh, again, in terms of that legislation and that implementation, that will be across all public bodies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to bring in uh, Willie Coffey, who's got some uh, more questions to put to you. Willie. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, Fiona Good and morning. colleagues. I wonder if I could ask a couple of questions on the issue of the written authority. Um, the committee, as you'll know, made a, a recommendation in its report that Transport Scotland and CMAL should clarify in writing the procedure for seeking reassurances from Scottish ministers and, and the government's welcome response to, to that, I think, was to accept that and to look forward to incorporating that process in the next revision of the framework agreement with CMAL. It's just to ask you for an update on progress with that. Is that in progress? Has that been done? And how is that progressing? So that there are specific requirements now in the, the Scottish Public Finance Manual um, for notification. Um, it's one of the areas that um, I want to seek clarification on in terms of what's shared when. Um, it obviously is published and it's, it obviously does go to the um, Auditor General and um, my understanding is that uh, the latest written authority, um, the accountable officer wrote to the Auditor General uh, when the latest written authority was provided. I would say written authorities very rarely happen um, in terms of you know what we would call sort of ministerial directions are, are few and far between. Um, I've never given a ministerial direction in the, the period of time I, I was a government minister um, and, and they can be appropriate for appropriate reasons but they're, I, I would um, you know, emphasise that and there's a, a process there. I suppose the, the, the issue is are they then um, I, and the bit that I wanted to query, which was one of the areas I said that I wanted to look at, was um, is that would that routinely be sent to the clerk, to the public audit committee, which I think was when, in, in your recommendation, I think paragraph 408, uh, page 77 of your report, my understanding the last one was, um, uh, and, but, and I said that that wouldn't necessarily happen that, that often. Is there anything of a reflected that correctly in terms of process? That's, no, that, that, that's, that's the... Um process I, mean, I think there's a few things tied up in in this there is a we are working on a new framework agreement that oversees the relationship between the Scottish government and Ferguson marine that is very close to being completed and it has clarified a number of issues around the governance relationship between ourselves and and that organization in terms of the written authority that was specifically prepared um, by uh, the cabinet secretary for for the economy in relation to the to the projected increase in costs reported in September 2022 and he did so um, in relation to 802 where uh, he, he took a view on, on the value for money case that was presented for that particular um, projected increase in costs. Thank you for that. Um, in accepting the committee's other recommendation about publication of written authorisations on the government's website, is that a commitment to 
to publish not only this one, but any that may have occurred in the past. The committee was clearly interested in seeing any examples of any such written authoriz authorisations that had been sought and, and um, so that's given. The, in yeah, so written authorities, as you know, can happen not just in this area, but in any area within ministerial control. Um, and they happen very rarely. In terms of the process of that, one of the questions I've got is, is, is this currently in the current edition of the Scottish Public Finance Manual, or will it be and when will it be, was a question I, I wanted to ask. But because it ha has an impact on other areas, that's why I wanted to, to check on that. So I'd gone through your report identifying what wasn't fully responded to. It was partially responded to, but is, is it fully? And clearly, in terms of that um, area, that's certainly something as, in terms of the response um, that that would be drawn to the attention of the Auditor General. Um, and going forward, we accept the committee's recommendation to publish confirmation of written author authorizations on the Scottish Government website. The, the, the difference I saw was you had a specific request to your about your committee and the clerk your committee automatically getting it, which is obviously it can be on the website. You can you can find it, but I think obviously you've got duty and responsibilities as the audit committee. And I just wanted to check that that has happened and and will happen at any time in the future. Should that sh should there be a written authorization? Mm -hmm. I, th I think the committee were keen to broaden that and just to see any governmental written authorisations that have occurred, would that be part of what you might well, consider it's doing? Yeah, I suppose... I mean, I, 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 I mean, there hadn't been a... Uh, I think we've had this discussion at previous committees. There hadn't been a written authority for many years. What I can say is, as the sort of head of the team that prepared the underpinning advice for the written authority that was issued, was that the, um, the experience and the guidance and the knowledge of civil service colleagues in the Scottish Government um, enabled that to happen in an appropriate way. So all of that um, support and expertise was available to anybody who was preparing advice for ministers or would be available for anyone who is preparing advice for ministers that could lead to a written authority in the future. OK, thank you for that. I wonder if I could just ask a slightly broader question to you, Minister. I mean, from, from the outset of the committee's work in the Ferries investigation, it became clear to me that the key problems were probably built in from the start of the project. And you've, you've mentioned that quite specifically in your comments to the committee. Uh, constantly changing design specifications as you build the ships uh, it's certainly a recipe for cost and time overruns that, that we saw. Um, if, if you look at the performance of, of all governments, past and present, you'll see perhaps a litany of public procurement cost overruns occurring in, in, in our experience, and the public can see those too. Can you? Can you offer the, the committee and the public your perspective on why that, you know, why some public procurement projects, some not all, do go wrong? And do you agree that it's absolutely vital to plan projects carefully at, at the outset to deploy recognised quality management standards and so on and processes to give all projects, no matter what they are, construction, IT, whatever, a fair chance that they can be completed on time and on budget? And how can you assure the committee and the public that that approach will be taken from now on with any procurement projects that the government might commission? So I'm not the minister responsible for public procurement policy, but I think you're inviting me to give a general response as a, as a government minister. And obviously there's this specific example. You talked of um, uh, public procurement issues and, and listening. Can I, can I probably also just make it clear that the Scottish Government have embarked on a number of major transport projects which have been on time and on budget. Uh, this one clearly hasn't and that's why not just yourselves but others have, um, have had inquiries into it. So I want to make it quite clear that actually the general practice in the Scottish Government has been good in that way and actually in terms of Transport Scotland. However, and this is the point of your committee, is the, and the point of your committee's report into this issue, clearly this has not been the case in this instance. And in terms of therefore what type of improvements are, and I think this is a point maybe to, to reassure you in terms of that lessons learned, we'll be pulling that together so we can actually document some of its processes. We've heard about the Scottish Public Finance 
um, uh, module. Some of it will be what some of the practices CMAL are doing, and a lot of the practices and changes they're doing are already affecting in the four um, vessels that are being built in Turkey. In terms of the um, issues around governance, and I think you're right, so my reflections on you know, is it important to get processes right at the beginning? Absolutely. I think anybody who's involved in any major project knows if you get things right at the beginning, there's less um, chance that things will go have, have a difficulty later on. So I absolutely understand that. In terms of some of the things that um, I can give you an indication of um, and changes from Transport Scotland, that it, um, in terms of improve, improvements, some of this has happened and have already in progress, even before the REC Committee's report and your own. But I think it will be helpful to draw them together um, um, at the end of this project to make sure that we can itemise all the changes and improvements that have taken place. There's now enhanced governance around vessel projects with dedicated project groups for projects and programmes. There's improved focus on use of existing risk registers for each project or programme. The scrutiny and sign-off of all vessel and major port projects by Transport Scotland's Investment Decision Making Board, and that's at Chief Executive Director's level. Greater use of independent um, gateway processes and approval uh, now requires accountable office template to be completed by the relevant CABSEC and the CABSEC for finance, which again I think Alison had set out in her area. So the, the issues, yes, and the issues around um, the lessons learned from this in terms of issues around design um, faults at the beginning having consequences, and we've seen those consequences even more latterly in, re in relation to some of the processes. So I think you're asking asking for an opinion. As opposed, and, and I've tried to provide not only opinion but responses as to where government's already taken changes in this specific area. But I, I would want to reinforce the fact that actually, when projects go well, you take them for granted in many ways, and that some of those have, and you've seen that in, in relation to the you know the M8 improvements and also the Queensferry crossing. And you know, so I, I think there's other areas that I want to just be quite clear that um, I absolutely accept there were severe overruns in this uh, in this project which is why you're doing what you're doing but it the challenge is when you're you know, auditing something that is some historical time away from eight years ago some of those processes and changes will have taken place along the way and i want to reassure the committee that um, i will keep on top of that as the minister to make sure that that continues thanks very much for that minister in the interest of time convener i'll hand back to Thanks very much. And uh, in the interest of time, one of the areas that we suggested um, there could be a, a revision of the uh, public recording of decisions, uh, which is something which occurred in this case, uh, where the CMAL board was kind of overridden by a shareholder authorisation, which has got an equivalence with a written authority. Um, I wonder whether you could respond in writing, not right now, Minister, uh, as to the government's position on uh, the recording, uh, the public recording of uh, instances of shareholder authorisation being required. So I think there's quite a lot to that because of the difference between ministerial direction, shareholder authorisation and letter of comfort, which the letter of comfort was the what was provided. But in the interest of time, I'm quite happy to try and give an explanation of what that was and what you're asking for. Yes, well, the, the, the government was the only shareholder involved, so that's... Uh... Anyway, but that would be helpful. Um, I'm going to turn now, finally, to Graeme Simpson, who's got some more questions to put to you. Graeme. Yeah, th thanks very much. Um, Minister, you'll be uh, aware, uh, because you've read it in the committee's report, um, that the, the Auditor-General uh, has been frustrated uh, uh, the, the lack of powers he has uh, in order to get to the bottom of where £128 million was spent by FMEL. Um, and he has, um, he has asked um, for more powers, and the committee has indeed written to uh, Neil Gray uh, about this issue. So just wonder um, what your thoughts are and whether the Auditor-General should have those extra powers. So clearly the government will reply, it's Neil Gray will reply um, in the timescale that you've, you've asked for to, to that request. So I can't, I don't want to second guess that. I think in terms of um, the responsibilities of the Auditor General, they obviously are going to speak to you and give evidence, I understand, themselves. And in terms of, I'm not sure if um, they've asked themselves to have that power asked you or asked, asked the government directly. Um, so in, term, in terms of that, they obviously they want to... The request is to look at the accounts of a private company, um, in this case the, the private Ferguson Marine Enterprise, uh, uh, sorry, en en Engineering Limited, 
And in terms of um, their request to do that, that's a matter for the Cabinet Secretary and they'll agree to respond to. I think in general there are issues around uh, private companies working with the government in any shape or form being subject to um, uh, the Auditor General at any point in time being able to investigate them by request of a special order. That has risks um, in terms of what that might mean in terms of investment or partnership and and whether companies would want to enter into any um, any arrangement. I think that's a risk element. There's nothing no, nothing actually to do with this specific case, but I would reflect that I'd, I think that's worth exploring as to whether that the con the unintended consequences of doing this in principle as a whether as opposed to the merits demerits of this particular case i'd also reflect on uh, my point that you did have feedback from an uh, evidence from david tideman as to where he thought the spend and the the problems were and also from cmail which you actually have evidenced in in your own report so i know you want me to say yes or no that's not my decision so i'm not going to take it on behalf of, of somebody else but as a i mean you'll know this from the experience you've had you deal with public bodies and the issue is, can you then have um, the Auditor General investigating? Technically, you probably could do, but what would be the consequences in the future for other situations and other private companies if there was a risk that the Auditor General would be able to seek and secure powers for um, investigation? But, I mean, that's stating a fairly obvious, I think, to, to you as a committee. OK, so but it's essentially we're going to have to wait and see. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, what, I'm not going to give you that. I can't what, give you that. What Neil Gray, what Neil Gray says. Um, OK, um, so, so moving on, you know, so from what, what uh, Willie Coffey was uh, asking about, about the written authority and um, the, the, the whole the whole cost issue, the costs of these vessels just, just seems to go up and up and up. Um, and that's why we ended up with Neil Gray giving giving that written authority. I mean, is there a is there a point at which, uh, in your view, the government should say no more? I, th I think the issue then is what is what is it that is in the public interest and is it in the public interest to make sure the vessels are completed for the islanders as the transport minister who have spoken to island communities i want these vessels all six of them and um, completed because we need that resilience which is a, the, the risk element we've got just now and so therefore um, i think the issue also then is about the yard and the and the capacity for shipbuilding jobs in the future and also that point about um how do we ensure that the the yard can be successful which is obviously the you know responsibility of neil gray so this in this instance there's there's a lot of different um aspects in terms of decision making about spend um i um understand that uh, you know once we've got through the kind of uh, and I think they're progressing well, the issues for the two vessels in re relation to um, the safety approvals. That will be reported to the Net Zero Energy um, Committee, hopefully by the end of the month in the next update. But then the vessel would go into to sea trials and uh, then you start getting 801 being launched. And I think actually I think that would be a great relief to, to the islanders. And of course, my job as Minister for Transport is to help support island communities receive the vessels. So, you know, you, you can make a judgment, all, all MSPs will make a judgment of when you say yes or no, but I think the, the importance here, and I think the Cabinet Secretary for um, the Economy, Neil Gray, set it out very, very clearly as to why he wanted, particularly on 802, which is obviously a challenge, as to why that should progress and be delivered. Well, I'm not, I'm not really sh clear what your view is uh, on the question. Uh, but that... Well, at any point in time, should a government say um, stop funding something, the answer is uh, obviously across the piece there will be decisions that are taken where sometimes a decision may be not to con continue with something. Um, and all I'm saying is I think the, the Cabinet Secretary, Neil Green, made it quite clear and he was very open and he came straight to Parliament to report that in a very forthright and I think very open way and I think that's the way government should do um, do business if there's a major decision like that and there'll be maybe instances where the answer is to do the reverse um, and that could happen in any ministerial portfolio at any time so it depends on the circumstances at the time. So I've just got one more question uh, and that is about the future of the yard because you mentioned it um, and the chief exec Mr Tideman uh, has recently asked for more money for the yard, I realise it's probably Neil Gray's responsibility, but you are here, and you did mention it. Um, so he he has asked for more money. I don't know how much money, um, in order to modernise the yard. Uh, that would, in my in my view, that could um, make the yard commercially viable. 
Um, so, is I mean, is that something that's come across your desk? I mean, are you sympathetic to that request? So, again, it's clear delineation of, of responsibilities, and uh, I understand that the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary met with the Chair and the Chief Executive um, of the nationalised Fergus Marine uh, Port Glasgow to discuss these issues clearly in relation to any investment decision as you would expect because that's exactly what your committee has been doing is identifying you what are the process there's got to be proper processes and due diligence diligence to make sure that you know, value for money, public interest, etc. All those matters um, are addressed and that's what the process is. I can't comment. Um, all I can say is that I, I think there's a, a, a general, and I think this is cross-party, um, that there is a willingness for Ferguson Marine to be successful and in terms of the report, and I'm going, maybe going back and reflecting on the convener's point about the workforce, I think your evidence you got from the workforce is that they were positive about the chief executive and was, a, you know, that he'd been talking about the need to get into a profitable situation to secure more work, etc. So I'm pleased that that's the agenda that's been discussed, but I can't give comment as to, to how that can and when the decision will be made in, on, on that matter. Well, yeah, just just to confirm that we are carrying out due diligence on the request from the the, the CEO. We have to um, look at it in relation to subsidy control rules, um, and we need to obviously ensure that it represents value for money for um, for, for the taxpayer. But we will be um, open and transparent, and we'll obviously report to Parliament when a decision on that is taken. Okay, well, thanks. We've uh, slightly run over our time, and I suspect we could go on much longer, Minister, but um, uh, we've got uh, another evidence session uh, this morning. So can I take this opportunity to thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, your input this morning, uh, both uh, Fiona Hislop as Minister for Transport, uh, Colin Cook, Alice Nervin and Chris Wilcock. Um, there may be things that we will follow up in writing with you, but um, uh, I thank you very much for your openness in uh, answering the questions that we've been putting to you this morning. Thank you very much. I'm now going to suspend the meeting to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, well, can I welcome uh, everyone back to the uh, second uh, session of uh, this morning's evidence taken uh, by the Public Audit Committee, and that is to consider uh, the Section 22 report by the Auditor General for Scotland uh, uh, following the audit of Scottish canals. Can I welcome our witnesses this morning, um, uh, which uh, include representatives both from uh, uh, Transport Scotland, the Government, uh, but also from Scottish canals. Uh, so, uh, we have got uh, with us this morning John Patterson, the Chief Executive of Scottish Canals, um, and sitting alongside Mr Patterson is uh, Maureen Campbell, who's the Chairperson of the Board of Scottish Canals. Uh, we've also got Sarah Jane Hanna, uh, who's the Director of Finance and Business Services uh, at Scottish Canals, and Richard Miller, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Scottish Canals. Uh, and uh, alongside Mr Miller, uh, our three representatives from Transport Scotland, the Interim Chief Executive, Alison Irvin. Uh, good morning, Alison. Uh, and alongside Alison Ir uh, Irvin is um, uh, Kerry Twyman, who's the Director of Finance and Corporate Services at Transport Scotland, uh, and Gary Cox, who's the Interim uh, Director, Aviation, Maritime, Freight and Canals in Transport Scotland. We've got some uh, questions to put to you um, about the report. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Mr Patterson, I'd like to invite you to make a short opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener. And on behalf of the leadership team, thank you for the opportunity to attend today. I joined Scottish Canals as Accountable Officer at the end of May this year. My priority was clearly to continue the momentum in the project plan to address the issues raised in last year's uh, Public Audit Committee. There has been significant progress made, which I can report to you now. First of all, I do need to highlight that Grant Thornton's external audit report for both years provides an assurance that there are no matters of significance identified out with audit testing of property plant and equipment. As a result, whilst we are accepting of Scotland, Audit Scotland Section 22 observations, we were wholly disappointed to receive a full disclaimer opinion to our accounts. The issue was and remains confined to the valuation of the canal infrastructure. We were not made aware until very late that such an extreme sanction was likely. Right up until March this year, we had expected a modified ring-fenced opinion. As a reminder of how we got here, Scottish Canals has been on a 250-year journey and has existed in various forms. A series of unconnected private enterprises built and funded the canals in different times since the late 1700s. And in the 1940s, the canals were nationalised and then reformed as one entity under British waterways. In 2012, English and Welsh canals separated from British waterways, leaving Scottish Canals to operate as a public corporation. The canal infrastructure value since 1960 has correctly, at that time, been written down to a nil value. Only new additions such as the Kelpies, Bowling Har Harbour, Claypits and Glasgow were valued at depreciated historic costs. This is in line with international uh, accounting standards, reporting standards. Between 2012 and 2020, there remained no requirement to place a financial value on a 2,700 canal assets. The new additions are predominantly from 2012 and total £51 million. These were already held at our financial fixed asset register, which existed. This had been accepted by auditors right up until 2020, including Grant Thornton in previous years prior to 2020. When Scottish Canals became an NDPB, there was a change in the rules with regard to the way in which we had to value our canals assets as a public corporation. From that point on, we had to comply with, with FREM. This then required a full valuation of the canal infrastructure covering over 200 years and 141 miles, not just those additions since 2012. This is clearly a, a huge and complex project. We needed to take a number of steps, including analysis of our canal infrastructure engineering records, benchmarking the historic costs of key components and structures against modern equivalent assets, developing a methodology for the very first time for our varied assets with external uh, team of specialists. We reported to committee last year that this was a substantial and multi-layered project with ambitious timescales for such a small organisation. Following the proof project plan with our best endeavours, I fully agree with the sta statements made by Auditor General and External Auditor in June of this year when they stated that we have made significant progress. We have. Since June last year, our team have worked hard to provide a valuation for over 2,700 assets of canal infrastructure. To give you a flavour of the range and complexity of these, 52 aqueducts, some of the longest in the UK, 19 large reservoirs, many in remote locations, 186 bridges of all varieties, spans, uh, sw swing fixed, um, and 164 lock gates of varying sizes and materials. The Falkirk, we own the Kelpies, of course, as well as an array of other items along our canals and embankments. All of these assets are at various stages in their life cycle, making their valuations unique and specific to each of them. 
The extensive audit finished in May, and since then we have continued to focus on our action plan addressing recommendations. Due to some cost records relating to over 30 years ago, now that's predating our digital records, we have had some limitations to our audit of evidence for obvious reasons, but we have worked to address this. We have also reassessed additions and capitalisation dates for all assets completed over the last three years, reviewed and verified the classifications of all structures and waterways, reconsidered our methodology and residual values and useful economic lives. We have reviewed key assets and their components to ensure there is sufficient detail in the fixed asset register. We have ensured our judgments and records on historic costs are clear and transparent. In addition, we have introduced an extensive new project management procedure and associated policies for going forward to support the accurate recording of any future investment in our assets. We will now be able to provide the auditors with all asset information in one concise report in time for the audit for last financial year, which is scheduled by Audit Scotland to commence in November. We wholly agree with the Auditor General that this is a serious issue. We are entirely focused on resolving it. Noting the Auditor General's observation that we should consider alternative options to address this issue, we have revisited the matter both internally and in a recent workshop in partnership with our sponsor, Transport Scotland. We concluded collectively that forming a fixed asset register with the valuation of assets remains the best and only viable option at this time. We have a full engagement with and support from our board in Transport Scotland to continue with this complex programme of work. I continue to personally chair a multidisciplinary project board to ensure that we achieve all stage milestones necessary to reach our goals. The valuation is well underway and advanced um, for the external audit commencing in November. However, until we understand the extent of the evidence required to meet the new auditor's bar of, of satisfaction, it does remain possible that there may be an additional level of evidence required to meet the external audit approval. Our experience to date has been that finding where that bar of audit satisfaction lay has been one of our main challenges. In summary, valuing this historic canal network is difficult, but we have made huge improvements. We remain fully focused in continuing this journey. We are committed to working positively with our new auditors, our sponsors and colleagues to meet requirements and provide a true and fair valuation in our annual reports and accounts. I welcome any questions from the committee. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mr Patterson. Just to clarify, when you speak of new auditors, that's because there is a ro rotation process, isn't there? So you've got a new, it's no longer Grant Thornton, it's a different uh, firm who's now auditing your accounts on behalf of Audit Scotland. Um, I'm going to invite the Deputy Convener, Sharon Dowie, to put uh, a question or two to you. Sharon. Morning. Um, the committee have noted the steps that Scottish Canals is taking to address the disclaimer opinion in its annual report on accounts for 2021-22. And we've also noted its commitment to delivering a set of accounts free from a disclaimer opinion and to laying its annual report on accounts in the new year. It appears that Scottish Canals faces a significant challenge to be able to meet its public accountability responsibilities and comply with financial reporting manual requirements. And I think we've heard that in your opening statement. Um, what contingencies, what contingencies do you have in place should you fail to do so? Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, our plan A is very much to comply with FREM and continue on with the, the, the work that we have at this point in time. We feel it's within reach, we feel it's viable, and we've aligned all the resources and priorities to, to achieving that goal and uh, forming a fixed asset register, which we believe would resolve that issue. As I mentioned in my statement, we are not aware, um, uh, or it's difficult to find where the bar of satisfaction of the external auditor we may rest at risk with the external auditor. Uh, we believe it's attainable. It's a very difficult project, um, but we believe it's attainable and we are fully committed to resolving that. So that is our plan A. Plan B will be to revisit the uh, options assessment that we looked at, at alternatives again, because part of the conclusion of the exercise that plan A is still the way to go is that we do believe it's achievable. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. You mentioned, obviously, that there's new auditors and you were talking about the bar that they expected. Have you managed to have any engagement with auditors to see what that bar will be? It's uh, early in the process. We've, we've touched base with, with Audit Scotland, who they know that directly uh, on this occasion they're a new external auditor. We have had early preliminary discussions with them. The financial audit process is scheduled by them for November. I'll ask Sarah Jane if she wants to expand upon that. Yeah, so um, we found out early in, the new year, early in the year that it was Audit Scotland themselves that are going to be doing our audit, so we look forward to, to working closely with them. They've um, already gathered a huge amount of preparatory uh, information on the organisation. Um, and a couple of weeks ago at our Audit and Risk Committee meeting, they presented their plan. So they've assessed Grant Thornton's external audit recommendations and assessed uh, on a risk basis what they think is important for this year. 
Um, so they'll be concentrating on the valuation, obviously, because that's a very high risk area. And in order to address the disclaimer for 21, 22 year and the 2021 year, they're going to look at all the balances for all three of those years. So this is not going to be an easy audit either. This is going to be quite complex. Um, they're auditing us over November, December, which means that our annual report and accounts will be a bit later. Usually the statutory reporting deadline is the 31st of December. So we're hoping to have the annual report and accounts signed and sealed um, by February by the board. Um, but we're working really closely with them. They've done some preliminary inquiries over the past couple of weeks as well, but they're, they're, the massive part of their audit won't start until the 1st of November. Okay, and are you getting enough support as well from Audit Scotland and other, uh, from Transport Scotland and others sitting in the room just now? But is, is there anything else that they could do to help and assist? Well, it is our set of annual report and accounts. I'm sure Transport Scotland would say that, and John is our accountable officer with regards to that. If I may, convener, the Transport Scotland has been very helpful to us, and they uh, have observation status at our board, and we are in regular contact on a regular basis. Um, they did fund the initial exercise that supported us financially to undertake the massive um, valuation of the canal infrastructure uh, and continue to be very supportive in, in our role. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. OK, can I just go back, um, uh, Sarah Jane Hanna, to what you said about the timing? Because one of the, one of the comments that was made to us when the Auditor General uh, gave evidence on the 23rd of June was, he said, I quote him, timeliness is relevant to scrutiny. Uh, because there was some concern, I think, about the late um, uh, approval of your accounts. I mean, what, are you going to be on course and on schedule for this year's accounts? I've already said we won't be meeting the statutory deadline, so no, we won't. Um, a late approval of accounts doesn't automatically warrant a Section 22 report, and a late lodging of accounts um, doesn't have any additional negative consequences. Over COVID, um, if you look at the UK government-wide, um, there are many NDPBs who have who have issued late, who have, who have registered their, their accounts late. So that that's not our main issue. Our main issue is to actually get the work done and get it done right. Mr. Patch, do you want to come in? Add to that, convener. Um, this is entirely correct. It, it's due to the timetable um, that, that we've been given by Audit Scotland to commence in November. It's, it's not actually related to Section 22 and the, the current work that's underway. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I mean, can I go back then to the, uh, the substantive point, which is uh, the fact that, um, uh, that a disclaimer has been issued, which again on uh, the 23rd of June when the Auditor General appeared before us, he emphasised that in his words it's a serious matter. Um, I mean, I think, Mr Patson, you issued a note uh, to accompany uh, the papers today uh, in which you spoke of a demanding time frame. That was your expression. Um, but when I look back to uh, the evidence we took last year, uh, I think, um, uh, Sarah Jane Hanna, you confirmed that uh, even back in the 2012-13 audit, although you weren't working there at that point, um, I think Audit Scotland had flagged up the possibility uh, that um, uh, a requirement to have uh, this uh, fixed asset register was something that you might be required to do. Um, and um, again, when I look back to November 2019, um, Scottish Canals look for a year's delay at that point, and we're nearly four years on, and it still isn't completed. I mean, do you want to comment on that? Why, you know, why are you still demanding? Uh, why are you still uh, seeking um, an understanding about the demanding time frame that you're facing? When you, it appears to me you've faced it for quite some time. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Clearly none of the panel here were, were around at that time in 2012 in, in the positions that uh, we represent today. My understanding, um, re researching historical records of, of the organisation uh, and discussions between the organisation Transport Scotland at the time, I think the organisation was very clear that they wanted to remain as a public corporation and therefore didn't have to comply with FREM. That wasn't the sole reason for it. Um, and the, the aspirations of the organisation at the time, the leadership of the organisation was to have a financial strategy that would encourage further revenue generation through the canal and associated infra infrastructure activities. That remained, again, the organisation's um, firm intent. Uh, I think there was lots of discussion back and forward um, about, with the ONS about uh, becoming a, not a public corporation or qualifying for public corporation. And I think the organisation were very confident the financial strategy would still result in a revenue growth that would keep us as a public corporation at that time. 
I understand closer to the 2019 that discussion became more intense, as it were, and a, a form of protest was put in by the organisation to ask for a delay. I think at that point it became obvious that um, if we had to comply with FREM, the, the um, whole uh, process we're going through just now couldn't be done within the time frame at that point in time. So that's, that's the only explanation I can afford the committee, unfortunately, we weren't here to, to hear that first hand. With regards to maybe November 2019 onwards, um, the, the Director of Finance left the organisation in December 19, um, and there was no Director of Finance until I joined the organisation in March 2021, when we, I think, I think it was May 2021, that we first received our accounts direction from Transport Scotland. So we had received some um, some preliminary advice from Grant Thornton in December 2020 with regards to the necessity to value our assets. At that time, it was valuing the assets that were on our books and records. So that is exactly what John was saying earlier on, the £51 million worth of additions of assets <coughs> in the infrastructure. So that's what we targeted to do um, as soon as I arrived, um, well, in, in June 2021. Um, it was only when it transpired that we didn't really have a choice then um, but to value the entire infrastructure. So Grant Thornton really found it uncomfortable to, for example, we'd, we'd, we'd spent some money on reservoirs. So we had spent capital on reservoirs, but there was no underlying valuation of the existing reservoir. So how could we determine that that capital was enhancing the asset, adding value to the asset without the underlying infrastructure? So the position that we were in from the 2021 point of view, where we, we spoke in March 2022 to the Public Audit Committee, is very, very different from the position now. So moving towards the 2021-22, we had to do evaluation of the entire infrastructure. Now, Audit Scotland did mention it in the 2012-2013 report. You're right. And I think the impetus was absolutely to ensure that we wouldn't actually be categorised as an NDPB and to really build the portfolio of, of income um, so that we weren't so reliant on grant and aid. Um, but yeah, it's been a very different journey the last year since March 2022. Um, valuation, valuing 250-year-old assets, 141 miles of canals, and the complex set of assets that, that, that John articulated is a very different journey from just valuing £51 million worth of additions. But do you accept the um, findings and recommendations of the Audit Scotland report? We, we do convene. We accept that. Um, we accept this is a serious matter not complying with FREM. Um, the magnitude uh, of the implications that could have uh, to the public purse, I think um, I wouldn't share the same views as the General for the simple reason that we have always had a fixed asset register. We maybe didn't have a pound sign in front of uh, each, each asset's name at that point in time, um, with the exception of the assets that were added from 2012. But the important thing is there's a number of tiers of controls over how we invest in public infrastructure in Scottish canals. We have a, an asset register and we have a an asset management strategy which looks at the condition, the age and uh, the serviceable life of the asset and the uh, cost of, of returning that asset back to uh, a good and serviceable standard. So our, our investments have always been focused on the right places, they've always been risk assessed and they've always been targeted to the appropriate investment. So from that side of things I don't share in the, the gravity of the potential consequences of not complying with FREM. We were an organisation that never had to comply with FREM right up until 2020. The canals have survived 200 years and we've successfully repurposed the canals and reinvented their uses as health and well-being, economic regeneration, tourism, instead of uh, moving coal as we used to be um, predominantly. So, yes, it's a serious matter not complying with the financial, um, the FREM manual itself, uh, but the, the potential for misdirection of public funds, I think, is absolutely negligible. I think it's important to, to reflect not just on the Section 22 Auditor General's report, but actually the external audit report, the, the detail of the external, external audit report from Grant Thornton itself. So I'm going to quote a couple of things. Um, in their evidence, they said there was no evidence of management override of controls. There was no indication of fraud or inappropriate management bias in accounting estimates. There were no exceptions in relation to the occurrence or accuracy or completeness of revenue at all. There were no exceptions with regards to cut-off of either income or expenditure, and investment properties were properly valued like they always have been. Um, the audit options um, for Grant Thornton were uh, an all unqualified clean opinion, they were a qualified opinion, and 
a disclaimer opinion or an adverse opinion. Now, an adverse opinion is not what we have here. That's when an auditor says that it absolutely doesn't, doesn't reflect the books and records. So that's not what we're talking about. What we, as, as John said, thought up until March this year is that we would have a qualified opinion. So a qualified opinion is usually when we don't have the information or we don't have the information within a realistic time scale. Now, we produced, uh, we, uh, we employed uh, our, our um, expert valuation team in July and then they completed the valuation in November. Now, we've been audited from October to May. So that's eight months worth of auditing. Um, so at the, in, in May, we decided, um, and we spoke to the Audit and Risk Committee, we could extend the audit for another two, three months, additional audit testing, trying to get Grant Thorne to get comfortable around some of our judgments and estimates. But we are a very small team. I have um, one technical financial accountant, I have one systems accountant, and I have two management accountants. So four people, and, and we've not had a head of finance since, since February. So to add that additional two or three month burden onto a very small team when we're needing to work on other aspects of the business and business as usual would have been quite a burden. Um, we do believe that that, that qualified opinion, um, we didn't have the information and we couldn't get the information within the right time would have been more appropriate rather than the disclaimer of opinion. But when I, um, let me quote back to you then, um, Mr. Patterson, Ms. Hannah, I mean, if I look at paragraph 15 of the Auditor General's report, there are expressions in there like could not be supported by evidence, lack of data, potential errors, there were errors, lack of documentation, several errors, and so on. So, there, I mean, there is quite a catalogue of criticisms of uh, your methodology, and uh, all of which has led to uh, a decision which has been taken uh, not to... Um, issue approval of your accounts and it is as I mentioned earlier on described by the Auditor General as a serious matter and I guess fr from my point of view um, I don't want us to be here again in a year's time uh, as I'm quite sure you don't but it feels as though we're we're hearing the same arguments that we heard a year ago uh, and um, I think we need persuading that things are things are moving forward uh, I think Graeme Simpson wants to come in then I'm going to bring in Colin Beatty yeah I just want to follow up on that, really. Uh, so, Sarah Jane, Hannah, when when is this exercise going to be complete? Whether you think it's worthwhile doing or not, you are doing it. When's it going to be finished? So we're due to receive the valuation for a, a revised valuation this week for the year ended 2022, um, and then we'll we'll do additional work and receive the valuation, the revised valuation um, for the 31st of March 2023 in the next three weeks, so that we can meet the auditor's deadline of giving them a, an annual report and accounts on the first of first of November. I thought you said earlier that it, it was going to be late. The the lodging of our accounts are going to be late. Um, they're going to be after 31st of December, but the audit starts in, in November, so we, we are responsible for handing over all that information. So the information you'll get this week, will that be a valuation of all your assets? We've done quite a significant amount of work um, to revise that valuation to address some of uh, the external audit recommendations. So we've reassessed all of our additions, um, we've reassessed um, the capitalisation dates, um, that removes the, the issue with regards to the audit report of duplication, possible duplication of assets. We reviewed and verified the classifications of all of our structures and waterways. That accounts for 93% of our £1.9 billion um, historical cost. Um, we are still looking at reconsidering, well, we've already reconsidered some of our methodology, um, which Grant Thornton had pointed out, um, in particular with regards to residual lives. Although with, regard, with regards to residual values in, in particular, the overall potential error that, that Grant Thornton identified was somewhere in the range of £20 million, and we're talking about £1.8 billion infrastructure. So um, there's a materiality level that the audit has to abide by that, that doesn't necessarily reflect the full value of the assets. Um, we're looking at our judgments and estimates, which Grant Thornton couldn't get comfortable with and trying to embolden some of our justifications, it's very difficult. In a letter of representation, any accountable officer will, will 
speak to the, the external auditors with regards to the judgments and estimates of any annual report and accounts, any set of annual report and accounts, and there always will be judgments and estimates. Um, it's, it's up to us to better, um, uh, better articulate them um, and work really closely with Audit Scotland um, to see if that helps the process. But it is a really complex, uh, complex valuation. There's, there's no getting around it. I, I completely understand that it's complex, it's difficult, um, but you need to do it. Um, so, I mean, have you been in, in discussions with Audit Scotland telling them how are you going about this, asking them at every step, is this the right way to do it? Because um, you don't want to be in the position where, you know, they say, sorry, you've done that the wrong way, go away and do it again, and we're back here again in a year's time. Yes, we have. Um, we, we've, we've given them all our planning documentation and our, this is our approach. What, we, what we've never done before is, is produce a, an actual fixed asset register. So uh, one place where all the assets are in one place. We have the, engine, the very detailed engineering asset register, but we've never had it in a financial basis in one place. So to be fair to Grant Thornton, that makes it very difficult to audit without having that transparency. Richard could probably talk more about that evidence as well. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this has been, as we said, very, very challenging. And, and as SJ says, we, we had four months so, so after the, the March committee last year. We, we took it really seriously, and, uh, but we had to go through public procurement at the scale of getting the right experts on board. We got the right experts on board uh, and brought uh, E&Y uh, on board and, and, and got involved and, and worked very closely with them. Uh, during uh, sort of July, August, September, right through to, to, to getting the fixed asset register in place. I think some of the challenges were around rights and ob obligations. That comes through in the report. But actually, of the 109 things that were uh, sampled by the auditor, 107 of them uh, were, were absolutely clear. And, and two of them uh, related to partnership um, uh, partnership structures that have been built previously. So we, whilst I think in the last few months we've been working extremely hard to, to refine, to learn from what GT showed us uh, and to deliver that and to develop that and to mature the uh, fixed asset register. So we're in a, in a good place now in regard to we've got the fixed asset register into one single document. That was always a challenge because okay. there was we had our plant on one side, we had our property on the other, and then we had this task of, of understanding the engineering side of the business. And, and I think, as John says, we had an asset management uh, strategy, so we had everything in sight. What we needed to do was to take it from an engineering purpose into a financial and accountancy purpose, and, and that's the task that we've been doing over the last few months. So we're moving definitely in the right direction here, and uh, things the fixed asset register will require to mature over years. But for the 1st of November, we're heading into the right direction to be able to put one comprehensive piece of uh, database uh, on the table for Audit Scotland to have a look at. And, and just so I understand, so that so you'll have a list of all your assets, um, and will there be a value attached to each of those assets? Every single asset. And, right. and that is a challenge as well, because as we said, and uh, as the convener said at the start there, these are assets of 250 years old. Yeah. The majority of them, 75, 80% of them, were built between 18, or 1768 to 1822. So we could have gone back to Thomas Telford's uh, accounts, and, <laughs> and that was a, we could have taken it straight line from there. But what we did was, was to develop it and, and look at it from a depreciated replacement cost because actually Scottish Canals has done a lot of work. In the last 25 years, £200 million of investment has gone into the canals. The majority of that third party funded and a lot of it European funded as well. So you can imagine how audited that was. So we've got that data and we've got evidence for each of these different structures. The challenge is then taking them and applying them to the older structures and getting the depreciated value. But we are in place for that. OK, well, I've just got one more question, convener, if that's OK. Short one. Yeah, short one. Um, it's for Mr Patterson, because you mentioned a financial strategy. Um, and I'm just wondering if it... I, I think you said um, something about the ability to earn money from, from the canals, which I think is really important. Um, are there any sort of restrictions on, on what you can do uh, in order to, for Scottish canals to earn money? Okay. 
I think the potential of the canals has still gone untapped. I think there is massive amounts of improvements we could make. Um, we have invested heavily uh, to become an active tran transport provider, in effect. The towpaths are now very active, um, cycleways and walkways and such like. We have attracted third-party funding from Sustrans and others to do that. We would like to grow revenue further. Um, things are very tight. Part of maintaining the canal network isn't just capital to replace lock gates and the likes. It's actually revenue to dredge and cut trees and weed, kill, uh, weed cut and such like. So the revenue uh, position is something we are very tight on. Um, and it's something we're looking to um, work with others, other public sector organisations in the shared services agenda to see if we can reduce their overheads and share in, in that space. Um, <coughs> it's something we want to do to develop the potential of the canals further in terms of investing in revenue projects, uh, and, you know, investing money into projects that would hopefully uh, un unlock that potential of the canals. I'm thinking uh, accommodation yeah. play a role in the housing um, side of things, living by water is, is a theme of our corporate plan. Um, temporary accommodation as well for uh, tourism and holiday accommodation. I think there's a number of areas that we could grow um, our revenue potential and there's a number of yet to be discovered opportunities across the canal network. I think one of the frustrations we have obviously as a public body is that we have to quite rightly invest very wisely. The, the bar, you know, we're not allowed to speculate to the same degree as a private sector organisation might. We're not necessarily, um, our risk, risk appetite would need to be low. And we need to be assured that our business cases would be very, very robust in doing so. But yes, I think there's more to come from Scottish Council. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we are pressed for time, but I'm going to turn to uh, Colin Beatty to ask a series of questions. Colin. Thank you, Peter. Uh, first question is really for uh, Transport Scotland. Uh, sponsorship. Uh, you're the sponsor team for Scottish Canals. Can you maybe describe a little bit about the support you're providing to them at this time? Okay, so I was pleased to hear uh, John confirm that they are content with the level of support they've been getting from my sponsorship team. I think I would quite like just to focus on some of the key kind of things that we've done over the last 12 months since the last time we were at PAC. Um, that would be a good place to start. Um, and then I'll bring Gary in just to see if there's anything uh, additional that he thinks would be helpful for you to be aware of. Um, so we have supported the team reviewing their method, their valuation methodology and their plans. Um, we've sought agreement from the Cabinet Secretary to bring in Ernest and Young to help with that work um, there. We have provided advice um, on how Transport Scotland values its assets in case there was any learning that the team could take from that. Um, we've obviously been party to some of the meetings between Scottish Canals and the auditors and we have helped where we can to provide advice uh, to the team on some of the questions that have been asked. Um, so I would hope that you would take from that that quite uh, an involved role in the sponsorship team here particularly to pick up on this really important issue because we want to support Scottish canals in order to get to a position where we don't have to come in front of a, um, your committee and, ans and answer questions like this. Gary, is there anything else that you would like to add? Yeah, I suppose just to, to, to say, you know, there's, there's a, you know, a clear role set out for me as AMFC director and for the sponsorship team in, in my directorate in the Scottish Canals Framework document. Um, and, you know, that, that's the basis for the relationship. But it is a very close one. I have two people who, who, who work on a day-to-day -day basis with Scottish Canals. Um, a lot of that is you know, the day-to-day the -day problem solving, the financial monitoring um, and you know, the, the sharing of public you know, information that's relevant to all public bodies. Um, so you know, we have a, a good team working with a good team at Scottish Canals. Uh, and, and my job is to make sure that that relationship stays positive and that Scottish Canals are continuing to work in line with the government's broader, broader um, agenda. Um, so, no, that's, that, that's, that's all I would add to Alison's comments. Can I ask if you've uh, asked for additional support from the Scottish Government's Public Bodies Unit and made use of any of the various tools that they provide to support you in your role as a sponsor team? Yeah. So, I, you know, again, there's, there's there's lessons shared across all public bodies, and and your public bodies unit in Scottish government um, identify common themes, identify common problems across the public bodies, and, and have a mechanism for for sharing that. And again, that's part of our role as a sponsorship team is making sure that Scottish mm -hmm. canals are aware of those 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 broader initiatives 
or, or you know, common problems and, and the solutions that have been identified. And I think you know, that's an important point in relation to the work that Scottish canals are going through just now. I would see at the end of this, when it's all put to bed, there will be lessons from this process that Scottish canals will want to share with the wider public sector, with other public bodies, indeed with other parts of Transport Scotland. Um, and that's something that we want to, to try and you know, pull together once the, 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 the heat has been taken out of this and, and the accounts have been settled and um, we'll share lessons from this process with other public bodies to see if that's useful. Just, just to be clear, have you asked for support from the Scottish Government's public bodies unit? No, I'm not aware I have. You have not. So you have the skills and expertise within Transport Scotland to be able to give that level of sponsor support in this what seems to be a fairly specialised area? It does, and that, that, that's just no, no the sort of um, the, the role of the sponsorship team. We obviously bringing expertise from other parts of the Scottish government to help Scottish canals, uh, in particular the, the expertise that exists in, in Kerry's team and, and the finance team in Transport Scotland. So you know the, the support that we have given as a sponsorship team has been supplemented by support from other bits of government, in particular finance colleagues. Yeah. Shall, I, shall I pick up on this? So, so the public bodies unit doesn't actually have dedicated finance support. So, so if, if I'm understanding what you're asking, what we have done is engaged closely with the Scottish Government fi relevant finance teams. So we've engaged closely with the governance and risk team on the accounts direction questions and, and where where you know, where, where we need to implement FREM and this idea around not being able to ask for exemptions from FREM. We've engaged closely with our Scottish Government Finance Business Partner Support Team, again, looking at any other instances where public bodies have gone through similar classification changes, how they've applied valuation and things of that. So, so as I said, that level of expertise doesn't rest within the public bodies unit. Um, so we've gone straight to the source, basically, on the finance support. But where there has been, as I said, high-level governance questions, that would be for the public body unit and as Gary said we work very closely with them um, disseminating information best practice across all of our sponsored bodies via our sponsor units in the in TS so that will have all gone to the canals team but of course you've actually gone outside uh, to get consultant support or at least Scottish canals have Indeed. and they spent half a million pounds on that with another hundred thousand pounds in this past financial year Indeed. Which is quite a lot of money. Indeed. I mean, Sarah Jane can probably answer more on that. I think that is, we did initially, we looked quite closely at the Trunk Road um, network, which was the, the, the kind of closest infrastructure asset we had. But that is a very, very complicated valuation model. I won't go into detail. It's all about layers of, of concrete and things. Mm -hmm. And when we did the comparison, we were able to kind of share high level principles and understanding, mm -hmm. but, but that didn't have the kind of direct read across. And when we looked at the actual hours and hours and hours of work that it would take and the technical expertise, it was felt that that wasn't on hand within either the Scottish Government or Transport Scotland. We didn't have that level of dedicated resource and it was felt that in order to get this done quickly, as we've said, and at the level of expertise and, and dedication needed, that the, in this particular instant an, an outside consultant would offer value for money. It's not, it's not as quick as you might think, is it? I think for all the reasons I've, I've mentioned, uh, Mr Beattie, that uh, this is an incredibly complex project. The asset base is huge. No one had ever valued a canal before. There was no methodology. The experts we, we did consult uh, even challenged them in terms of coming up with that methodology. We did test that methodology with our external auditor. Um, the methodology itself was agreed. I think it was the level of comfort of evidence that was available to the external auditor that proved um, that, uh, that bar of satisfaction that we were yet to satisfy. And that's been our biggest challenge all along has been that bar of satisfaction. It's felt throughout the process, you know, a bit akin to um, the teacher marking your exam paper, telling where you got it wrong. But we, we did hear that it's not the job of the external audit to teach Scottish canals how to devalue the canal network. So we found ourselves unable to pass the exam question and having to teach ourselves in effect. Yeah. With regards to the amount of money, obviously, um, we would rather not spend £600,000 of the taxpayers' money on anything like this. Is there um, going to be more this year? So, no, it, it's just an extra £100,000. <laughs> it's an extra £100,000, just so the five hundred plus another £100,000. that finishes 000. it. So what we'll have to do in, in future years is we will have to go out and tender. So um, what, what we will be provided is evaluation for the year end of 2022, evaluation for the year end of 2023, 
um, by our um, expert valuers. Um, and we will provide the fixed asset register for going forward. Now, they will be providing us with enough information so that, because I, th I think it said somewhere in the Auditor General's report that we won't own the model, we will own enough of the information to be able to go out to tender so that in future years um, we can do a proper tender process and, and the valuation, because it's already in existence and the fixed asset register is already in existence, it should be a much smaller exercise. But this, this happens at the end of every single year. You know, to provide a set of annual report and accounts, you have to value your investment properties, which we already do. We'll be valuing these as well. We have to do an actuarial valuation. We have to do a corporation tax computation. So these are all um, provided externally. But the, there were only about four... Well, really, the big four uh, accountancy firms that could provide the the RICS valuers that were that were um, that had enough experience, and actually they did have canal experience, and they did have experience with waterways and utilities and inf massive infrastructure projects. Um, but that mix of the valuation experience and the technical accounting experience. But there's a very important point that you mentioned there, which is about ownership of the model, and the current consultants own that. So you're going to have to presumably pay them something? No, we will, we will have that going forward so that we can go out to tender to other organisations. Okay, that's good news. That, that takes oh, me... uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but we're really up against the time. And I know okay. that Willie has got okay. some questions that he wants to put, so I'm, I'm keen. The truth of the matter is we've been very busy this morning, and it may be, rather than give you lots of oral questions, we can maybe put some of the questions we don't get to in writing to mm. you, and you can perhaps respond or... We'll, we can consider as a committee how best we think that could be prosecuted, if you'll pardon the expression. But Willie Coffey, I want to come to you. Uh, thanks. Good morning, and good morning, John and colleagues. Um, John, you, you, you covered a lot of ground in your opening statements there, and uh, I've been a member of the Audit Committee for more years than I, I can probably remember, and, and dealt with reports from Audit Scotland, Section 22s, 23s, and so on. But I feel I have to say to you that the response that you're given the committee doesn't appear to me to be cognizant with actually accepting the recommendations in full. You did say that, but the impression I've got from some of your responses don't suggest that. I mean, you, you said that you didn't share the gravity of the situation. You said the potential for misapplication of public funds is neg negligible, but are you, are you aware, do you accept that you are absolutely required to comply with the Treasury's guidance in this? And if you don't do that, where is the public assurance coming yeah. from? So d just to be clear, Mr Coffey, we fully accept the Auditor General's recommendation. The, the point of disagreement is perhaps the level of sanction applied, given that it was a, a matter confined purely to our fixed asset register and that there was a clear plan and that was work in progress. So it's the sanction perhaps that we disagree with. Uh, not the actual recommendation in Section 22. We felt it could have been a ring-fenced opinion, which would have um, you know, not triggered the Section 22 um, report and the adverse comments that we did receive. We were on track for, for fixing this issue. We remain very much on track and fully focused on fixing this issue. So we, we very much take this seriously, um, and we, we keep our uh, board fully appraised at all times, and Transport Scotland are um, also fully appraised at all times, and all parties are aligned to the fact that we are fully resourcing and prioritising this and that we will remedy this matter in due course. So just to clarify, we fully accept the auditor's opinion. Um, we took issue with the level of sanction. We felt that could have been a more appropriate... Um, there could have been alternative um, ways of addressing this. But do you get why I'm saying this yep. to you? That, you know, if you don't comply, there is therefore no public assurance, and surely that is a grave matter. I mean, I know it's a difficult and a complex process to get there, but so, it certainly has to be regarded as a grave matter if you can't give the public the assurance and the, yep. the, the matters that we seek assurance so, on. So it absolutely is a grave matter. Had all the gen general used potentially serious, then I would have fully aligned with that statement. Um, it is very potentially serious, but as I mentioned previously, there are tiers and tiers of controls of how we um, target and make sure um, that we, we fund our investments into assets very carefully. There's a clear methodology for doing so. So the suggestion that we could be misappropriating funds in any way or misdirecting funds is wholly unsubstantiated. And on that basis, we disagree with the level of sanction. OK, I'll, I'll leave that point there. Just to, one of the things you didn't mention, though, Joan, was the, the amount of money that you have spent in consultant fees. And I think it's now £600,000. 
Is the public getting value for money from that exercise? And is it allowing you, is it helping you to understand what this bar of audit satisfaction actually is that was mentioned earlier? Is it allowing you to get there? Because when, if you do come back next year, this absolutely has to be sorted. Surely you accept that? We, we do accept that. Um, to be clear, we had no choice. This was a, a crash course we had to do um, and, and a crash exercise within a, a very short period of time. Um, obviously, our intention had been to avoid the Section 22 disclaimer um, for a second year in a row. There was no choice. This was the only way of doing it. There was no methodology in existence. Even the experts in surveying found this a challenging exercise. There was no alternative. And as mentioned previously, most organisations would do this over a sustained period. They would do a you know, five-year rolling programme of revaluing assets. So in all probability, you'd cover the same ground over five years. We've had to do it in a very, very short space of time. Uh, and therefore, going forward, it'll be once we reach the point of, of an agreed fixed asset register and we pass the test of external audit and the bar of satisfaction, I would foresee a sustained programme over, say, a five-year cycle of re-evaluing the, the valuation of our canal assets in the way that many other public bodies would do. Last, last question. Sure. Um, you also mentioned the separation between English and Welsh canals and Scottish canals. Was there any opportunity taken to consult with that organisation about how they went through this process? Are they in the same boat as you, literally, or have they completed this exercise and do they comply fully? My understanding is that the canals and sorry, my understanding is the canals and rivers trust are a charity, and therefore, Frem does not apply to the same way as us. But um, Richard can explain. He has lots of contact with his former colleagues, um, and there's, uh, they were fully involved in the process to try and assist as well. I think in, uh, in 2012, Scottish canals remained in the shell of British waterways, and, and we became under under Scottish government, where all, in, in England and Wales became Canal River Trust, a complete charity. So we are in regular contact with them. Uh, and, and we are in contact with other global organisations as well to talk around about uh, canals. And we know Waterways Island are going through a similar process, but they're behind us in this process. And, and we've spoken to a number of European and, and other organisations. So we, we cast a net wide to try and see if there was a methodology out there for, for waterways and, and for, for this sort of work. And we are actually at the very front of this. Uh, and that does cost money, and, and that is taking time. But we are convinced that the team uh, from EY, as, as SJ said earlier, they've got the experience of building these from the ground up, and, and they're working in the Middle East and, and in places like Africa, where they're, they're starting from the absolute ground up, building these fixed asset registers. And, and, and unfortunately, it isn't cheap, and it, and it is very expensive to do, but it will be at the core of our business moving forward. The connection between the fixed asset register and our asset management strategy and the ability for, for government to see what, what is sitting on the, the books in these heritage uh, infrastructure. Uh, as was said earlier, I think um, by Transport Scotland, there is a lot to be learned uh, across the public sector for other organisations uh, that will probably follow us in this process. Just for assurance, um, that was one of the initial things that we did. The joint um, Transport Scotland and, and Scottish Canals finance teams, we actually set up meetings with our counterparts um, in the English and Welsh body and had a really, really w fascinating discussion on, on, on technical accounting and what they were doing, what we were doing. But it became very clear, as Richard has outlined, our colleagues have outlined, that they are still, because of the way that the decisions were taken over control at the time in 2012, they remain a charity in a completely different um, um, government type of body, no ONS reclassification, therefore they don't need to abide by the FREM. So they've stuck with a historical nil valuation. Um, so, so, you know, they were interested in what was going to need to be done up here, but a completely different set of rules applied to them. Okay, that is very, very helpful. Thank you all for responding to those questions. Convener. Thank you very much. I don't know whether Graeme Simpson has got any further questions to, to put. Um, but if he hasn't, uh, that, I think, uh, uh, concludes the session uh, this morning. Uh, so can I thank all of you from Transport Scotland and Scottish Canals for uh, your time and your evidence. Uh, there are some things that we may want to follow up, uh, and uh, we'll need to consider as a committee what our next steps are, whether we need to bring you back in again before next year or you're not going to we're not going to see you again for a long time or whatever uh, all of that is not entirely in our hands of course you understand but um uh, can i thank you very much for your time and your patience this morning uh we will as i say as a committee consider what our next steps are and uh, there certainly are some things i think we might want to follow up in in writing with you but uh, th thanks very much indeed i now draw the uh, public part of this morning's committee to a close thank you <laughs>